Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm State Senator Melinda Bush. Uh, welcome to your town hall. I uh, apologize. So I, I apologize for the group of people that are outside that we are still trying to get some streaming um, done. Uh, it's difficult to anticipate how many people are going to be here. I'm thrilled to have so many people here to get their questions answered, so thank you. Um, I want to welcome uh, a few people. I'd like to welcome, we have a lot of elected officials here. Uh, I think I have all of your names. I'm going to do it really quickly. I um, want to welcome them and thank them for being here. I know how important this issue is to all of us. Uh, so uh, Cheryl Ross, Gurney Village Board, John Wasick, Lake County Board, Quinn O'Brien, Gurney Village Board, Karen Thornton, Kearney Village Board, Steve Carlson, County Board, Ann Taylor, Waukegan Ninth Board Alderwoman, Mary Ross Cunningham, Vice Chair, Lake County, excuse me, Lake County Board, Jessica Valitsik, County Board, Carissa Caspan, Milburn, uh, excuse me, School District 24, Board of Education, David Weinstein, Wood, Woodland School Board, Sandy Hart, uh, Chairwoman, Lake County Board, Judy Martini, County Board Number 5, Diane Hewitt, County Board Number 2, Elizabeth Davies, Grace Lake Village Board, Pete Furlong, Trustee, Village of uh, Green Oaks, Ann Main, Lake County Board, District 21, Paul Frank, Lake County Board, District 11, Christina Kovara, Mayor Gurney, Mary Edley Allen, State Rep, uh, District 51, uh, Leon Rockingham, Mayor, City of North Chicago, uh, Monique Herbert, um, not sure, and I saw a couple people that are on the list. I saw Representative Yingling, uh, and I saw Representative Mason, and thank you very much, Congressman Brad Schneider. Um, thank you. Oh, and sorry, the word on the sign, and I'm so sorry. Uh, and of course, uh, Representative Rita Mayfield. And did I miss anybody? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Dick. Okay, anybody that we missed, could you stand up quickly so I can recognize? <laughs> Dick Barr, County Board, what's your district, Dick? Uh, three. three. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Jean Kirby, uh, Avon Township Clerk. Okay. Anyone else? Greg Garner. Bill Jagurney. Thank you very much, Bill Jagurney. So, thank you. I want to thank them for being here. This is an issue that concerns all of us in Lake County. Um, I also want to make sure to thank the College of Lake County. Uh, they have bent over backwards um, to help us put this together. And I'm just going to thank my staff because, you know, you probably don't know this, but Senate offices are really just not that big. I have two people in my Senate office, and they put this all together. So I, I just want to give them an amazing shout out to all of They're the ones always doing the real work, and I truly appreciate it. So, I'm just going to make brief opening remarks. And again, this is you know, it's not about us tonight, the elected officials. It's about it's about you. It's about getting the information that you need. So, on November 2nd, uh, 2019, newspaper reporter Michael Hawthorne broke a story: two Lake County polluters emit same cancer-causing gas as sterogenics, but authorities hadn't warned the public. Since that time, Illinois has passed the strongest restrictions for ethylene oxide emissions in the United States and most likely the world. Both Medline and Vantage are in the process of permits and installations to comply with those new regulations. But what are we actually doing? Is this enough? What do we know? And why don't we, and why didn't we know sooner? Residents have a right to ask these questions and they have the right to have them answered. I've been working with our communities and with South ETO, and that's why tonight we're holding this informational town hall. It's not a political event. We're not here for that. We're here to answer questions. And I want to remind you that the people that are here tonight are not policymakers. These are the scientists, these are the experts. And remember that when you're answering, when you're asking them questions. If you don't like what we do as elected officials, feel free to yell at us. Please remember not to yell at them. They're carrying out policies that we develop. Anyway, I wanted to make sure to say that. Thank you for being here. And I want to introduce those that are here. Uh, from the IEPA, 
Um, we are truly honored to have John Kim, our director, here tonight. Thank you for driving up here. Thank you for being here, John. Grant Frost, <laughs> IPA Manager, Community Relations. Kevin Madison, Environmental Protection Engineer. From ATSDR, we have Captain Michelle College, Environmental Health Scientist, Division of Community Health Investigations, ATSDR Region 5, Chicago. Mark Johnson, my gosh, you've got a lot of things. Toxicologist and Regional Director, Division of Community Health Investigations, ATSDR Regional 5, Chicago. Um, I'd like to now just bring up quickly um, Judy Armstrong. Um, we will be, the League of Women Voters will be handling the questions tonight. Um, we wanted to make sure that that you knew that things were be hand, being handled in a professional way and they are a nonpartisan organization. We just felt it was really important that they were here to help out tonight. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. It, it's our pleasure as League to be here tonight. League of Women Voters is going to be 100 years old in 2020. You may not all realize it, but the League of Women Voters was an outgrowth of the suffrage movement. Women earned the right to vote and then realized that it came with great responsibility. And that responsibility is to educate ourselves on issues, to seek out facts, to dialogue with our representatives in a healthy, wholesome way. And so for 100 years, League of Women Voters has been dedicated to public education, voter education, and working to provide facts, not opinion. We therefore are honored to partner with Senator Bush's office tonight in this town hall meeting. This night is going to be about fair and balanced questions. Normally, the League will ask people to write out their questions and we screen them to be sure they're non-inflammatory, that they're not grandstanding, that they are not gotcha questions, that they are questions that lead to civil dialogue. Tonight, we recognize that everyone here has a shared common vision of a healthy Lake County. So we are trusting your judgment to self-govern your questions. If a question has already been asked, please do not use time duplicating the question. Please be sure that you're presenting your question in a non-inflammatory way. And as the Senator said, please remember, everyone here tonight on our panel is part of an agency and they're actually devoting their time to be here tonight. So we very much appreciate their presence and we ask you to participate um, fully this evening um, within those guidelines. Now, a few of the people have said to us that they're used to writing out their questions and having us read them. We don't, and that they felt a little intimidated by going to the microphone. We want people to get their questions answered, and that's why we did that little bit of a shift to, as long as your name is called, go to the mic. If you're timid about speaking into the mic, simply hand your question to the moderator from Lee, who will be standing at the microphone, and she will read the question for you. Okay, we're all good? Okay, let's start with our first three questions. I'm sorry, just before we do that, I want to make sure to um, introduce and give them just a couple of minutes. We have uh, uh, Taya Tanaka and Yolanta, both are from uh, Stop UTO. These are women that have really been fighting. Thank you everyone who has come here tonight. We have been trying to get this town hall for 11 months and, thank, and thankfully uh, Senator Melinda Bush put this together for us. So thank you very much, Senator. And thank you everyone of you who came here. Uh, my name is Thea Tanaka. I am a senior scientist. I'm a parent, I'm a neighbor in Lake County. Um, our movement, Stop ETO in Lake County, is a grassroots movement. We came together as a group after November 2nd article from Chicago Tribune 
um, Michael Halter and Chicago Tribune article about ethylene oxide in our air. Since then, we have been trying to get, uh, since then we've coalesced and we have three missions. One of them is to raise awareness of ethylene oxide. The second was to get testing in Lake County. Uh, and the third one was to get legislation. And we've been working hand in hand with the senator and with our legislators, other legislators, to get legislation for all of us to be protected. Thank you, Taya. So how do we do that to raise awareness? We've had rallies, we've had yard signs, we've had bumper, bumper stickers on our cars, we had t-shirts, which thank you for wearing yours tonight. Um, a variety of meetings with legislators and government officials and, and attending local meetings to push them to say this, is, this issue is truly serious. So that is why we're here. Um, we've been waiting, as, as Taya mentioned, 11 months for this meeting and it's finally here, but I always say better late than never. So thank you for coming. And um, to just to talk about the serious of this issue, during the Michael Hawthorne article, it was identified that 109 set census tracts out of 73,057 nationwide had cancer risk exceeding the rate acceptable by the US EPA, and that is 101 million. So Gurney and Waukegan and Lake County is one of those 109 uh, census tracts that has elevated cancer risk. So just to stress the importance of why this issue is so serious and so important, and why we've been advocating for 11 months, because we want to make sure it gets the proper attention it deserves. Our mission is to ban ethylene oxide emission next to our homes and schools. You could put it in the country in the middle of nowhere, but we don't want it next to our houses. Um, I would like, thank you. I would like to thank the senator for putting this town hall together because you, it's been a lot of pushing, a lot of prodding to get to this point, and it's it's incredibly ecstatic to see this room filled with concerned residents that are here to ask questions and are here interested in this issue and advocating for our community. So thank you so much. And finally, I just would like to mention that. You know, this issue is not only impacting Lake County. It has impacted Willowbrook in Illinois. It, there is a facility uh, close by Brookfield Zoo, uh, L Corporation, that is emitting ethylene oxide. And there's a facility in Smyrna, Georgia. So this is not the only community. That, we're just one of 109 census tracts that is impacted. And what I want to emphasize is, you know, those, the communities in Willowbrook and the communities in Smyrna are getting attention and they're getting results. Both facilities are officially sealed. They are not emitting ethylene oxide into the air. In, and right now, uh, Lake County facilities are still emitting. I know they're adding additional pollution controls, but they're still emitting. So I just want to set that up front just so everybody's aware. And hopefully, with this presence tonight, we're here to change that. So thank you for coming. You know, during tonight's dialogue and questioning, let's be incredibly respectful and let's have constructive dialogue that is, you know, not necessarily inflammatory, but it's about, let's get this issue addressed and let's have a discussion and a, a two-way dialogue. So far, we've had a one-way dialogue. This is your chance as a community to ask your questions, but let's be respectful. Thank you. turn this meeting over to um, John Kim. Okay. Uh, is this working? Oh, yeah. it is? Okay. Um, uh, uh, slides? I'm sorry, Jeff. Slides or no slides? <laughs> okay. Oh, were they? I'm going to ask you what you said again because when you get to be in your 60s, you know, you can't. <laughs> appreciation for the work that Senator uh, Bush and her staff have done to set this up um, through the course of the past spring session especially we our, our agency has done a lot of work 
uh, with different legislators uh, associated with the different bills that were um, introduced and ultimately the ones that were uh, passed out of the General Assembly and signed by the governor. And I, I can tell you that my firsthand experience with Senator Bush has been that she's been very, very dedicated to this issue. She's been very reasonable. She's been very open-minded about trying to find results. But time and again, the, the, the key word that she's always come back to us is she just wants to try and find the best resolution possible for the people in her community. So I, uh, and, and you know, this is, I, I, I don't really need to uh, butter her up because we're already here, but I, I really do appreciate the fact that she has been uh, really a very responsible and dedicated legislator. They all have. We've worked with a number of legislators. They all have uh, their own concerns. And they've all got community bases that are very worried about what's going on, but certainly uh, Senator and her staff have been very helpful for us. Um, and uh, before I get to my slides, I just want to say this is, what I'm going to do is just give you an overview. You're a very well-educated group. Uh, you're, I, I think one of the one of the interesting things, this whole case, these, th this issue has been really interesting how it's developed. It's a very unusual kind of uh, uh, case for us because the sequence of events that I'll get into in a minute are not typical. And so the response and the, the way that things have gone is not typical. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But one of the things that, uh, that has come out that I think has been a plus is both in the Willowbrook community and certainly here, um, you've got a very <laughs> well-organized very well-educated uh, citizen group that has been extremely effective. And um, it, it's not to say that we don't deal with citizens on a regular basis, we do. We, we deal with citizen groups all the time. But I, the, the fact that the issue has been a very difficult one and that it has been kept in the fore because of the efforts of those groups, I, I think says a lot of, uh, about the, the people who are behind that and the people who are invested in that. And so, uh, you know, I commend you on that. Um, sure. So let me just, before I, uh, so let me give you a little bit of quick background about the Illinois EPA. And, and again, uh, many of you may know some of this, but I, I just want to, and I'll, so I'll do it quickly, but I want to make sure that everyone sort of is coming from the same place. Um, so the Illinois EPA is what we call, what, what courts have called a creature statute. And what that means is, we are an executive agency, just like a lot of other executive agencies in the state, Department of Transportation, Revenue, what have you, and we're created by statute. And so what that means is we do everything that we're obligated to do under our statute. We can't go beyond what we're authorized to do under our statute. So we, we are held to a very specific set of legal standards and legal requirements in terms of what it is we do. And, and I think that's what you want. You don't want a situation where you have a state agency that is deciding arbitrarily I don't like this company, I don't like this group, I don't like this individual, and not necessarily because it's a legally founded or a factually founded thing, just because we don't like them, we're going to take steps and we're going to sort of lower the boom. That's, first of all, from a, from a legal perspective and from a just a justice perspective, that's not a good idea. But from, uh, from fair and balanced administration of, of, of how laws are supposed to work for, all, for everybody across the spectrum, agencies like ours, need to make sure that what we're doing is we're, sorry, we're working within the uh, specific legal authority that we've been providing. So that's what we mean when we say a creature or statute. We are everything that the General Assembly authorizes us to do, and we cannot go beyond what the General Assembly has not authorized us to do. So within that statute, and our, our main statute that we work with is the uh, Illinois Environmental Protection Act, we have a general mission statement, and that mission statement is to safeguard environmental quality to protect health, protect welfare, to protect property. And it's a very broad mission statement. But the whole point behind the mission statement is we are trying to directly improve the quality of life for all of our citizens by focusing on bringing the most stringent level of environmental protection that we can statewide. And how do we do that? So we have three main tools that our agency uses that we've been given, again, by statute, to, to make that happen. We have permitting authority, we have the ability to propose regulations to a separate state agency called the Illinois Pollution Control Board, and we have the ability to bring enforcement actions. So let me touch on these just quickly. Permitting is our primary means of regulation. That is the act that is a direct 
uh, relationship between us and a regulated entity. We work very closely with the regulated community. We, uh, it is to their benefit and to ours and to everybody else's in the state that they understand what the requirements are that we're imposing upon them, that we understand what they uh, are concerned about in terms of potential uh, technical feasibilities, and we want to make sure that when we issue permits, that what we are doing is we've, we've uh, met our statutory mandate, but also, where it's appropriate, we've pushed as far as we can. So there's a standard, a lot of legal standards, but there's a, a standard when you talk about when do you issue a permit. And what that basically is is this. If you have a situation where someone has submitted a permit application, and that permit application will result, if you grant that application, will result in them being out of compliance, in other words, that it would result in a violation of the act, we have to deny that permit. Conversely, if that permit application demonstrates that if they do the things that are in that application, that they will be in compliance, then we are obligated to grant that permit. The one side part to that is we have the authority to modify a permit application. So if someone comes to us and says, I want to do the following 10 things, and we feel those are those are sufficient in the sense that they will meet the legal standard. However, we feel that those can be enhanced or we can bring those a little closer to what the, the, the intent behind the regulations are, then we can add conditions to that permit, special conditions that will further qualify and restrict and impose requirements upon that company or that regulated entity in terms of how they're gonna do work. So permitting are primary means of uh, regulation in the state. Regulations are basically just the rules. And, um, when you look at one of our permits, and um, they're long, depending upon the type of facility that you have, all of those requirements that are in that permit are derived from either a statutory requirement or a regulatory requirement. Because again, we can't go beyond that. Um, so when we, when we uh, conduct a rulemaking exercise, we have to make sure from a technical perspective that what we are proposing is feasible, because you don't want to, it doesn't benefit anyone to propose a rule that is basically never going to be able to be complied with. Technically feasible, but also is designed to specifically meet the goals of the statute that authorizes us to do that. So the way that happens is we will work very closely uh, with all of our stakeholders, the regulated community, interested citizen groups, um, elected officials. We will work with everybody, and then we will come up with a proposed rule we will uh, generally have that an opportunity for people to look at that and, and weigh in and give us comments. And then we propose that rule to the Illinois Pollution Control Board. As soon as we pro propose that rule, that becomes their rule. And what we're doing now is we're basically the proponent. We're trying to say, this is what you should do. But from that point on, it is their rule, and they then take the responsibility for determining what that rule is gonna look like, how it's gonna go. They will hold hearings, they will come up with a final rule, they will uh, adopt that, the last step before the rule becomes final is it goes back to a special committee made up of legislators called the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, or JCAR, J-C-A-R. They have the final approval. Once that's all good, that rule becomes effective and it goes on the books. That process, generally speaking, takes anywhere from a year to two years. So a rulemaking process is important, but it's also not a quick process. You compare that with a legislative process. You look at what happened in the uh, spring 2019 General Assembly session. So the uh, concerns about ethylene oxide were raised and, and really reached, reached sort of a, a fever pitch late in 2019, uh, or I'm sorry, 2018. By the end of the 2019 session, there were two bills that were introduced, and through that session, there were a number of other bills that had been introduced and discussed. Two bills introduced, signed by the governor, in a much quicker fashion than you would have had had you done that very same type of uh, exercise and those requirements through a rulemaking. That rulemaking would still be going on. So while a rule is necessary because it gets much more specific than a statute, the, the trade-off is it takes a, it's a longer process. The last thing that we do is enforcement. And we have different means of, of bringing enforcement within the state. What we are authorized to do is to go out, conduct inspections, we, when we issue permits, that again, that's our primary means of regulation, so that also means when we issue you a permit, you are responsible for making sure that you do all the things that are in that permit. Aside from that, there's just general provisions in the Environmental Protection Act, 
you don't have to have a permit from us if you're doing something, if you're open dumping, if you're if you are uh, burning waste that you're not supposed to, if you're pouring uh, waste down a sewer. We don't have a permit with you, but you, just like any other citizen or any other entity in the state, are required to comply with that statute, and we can bring an enforcement action. We do that in a number of ways. The most typical way we do that is there's a specific statutory process that requires us to issue a violation notice to a company. They have an opportunity to come back and ask us for a meeting to discuss it. They then have the opportunity to ask us to consider uh, an administrative settlement, something called a Compliance Commitment Agreement, or a CCA. If we agree that makes sense, then we'll enter into that CCA agreement with the regulated entity. That's just between the Illinois EPA and that entity. That's typically done if we don't need to get a penalty out of the case, and if the resolution is the technical resolution is already done, or it can be done quickly. If those things can't happen, we need a, per a penalty, or it's a much more complicated case, we will not allow the case to be resolved by a CCA, and we'll instead send a notice to the company that says, we have a, this is a notice of intent to pursue legal action. That's another statutory requirement. They have the ability to ask for a meeting there. They can come in, talk to us, we can do that meeting, and then if we still are of the opinion, and we um, almost always are, that we need to refer that case, we then send a referral to the Attorney General's office, sometimes to a state's attorney, asking them to pursue that case for us. So that process, again, when you take into consideration the, the built-in pro uh, due process uh, obligations for notice and meetings and so forth, it's typically a six to eight month process from the time we get the uh, inspection done to the time we can get that uh, referral out the door. And then once it gets to the Attorney General's office, they do a very good job of working as fast as they can, but uh, when you're talking about formal litigation, that obviously uh, brings in a lot of a lot of issues into play, a lot of attorneys into play, and so that sometimes you know it, it, it takes its own course. We do have certain special authority um, to act much quicker. We have two specific types of authority that we can do. One is something called uh, a referral to the attorney general's office for an immediate injunction. That's under a certain uh, provision in the act, and what that means is if we see conditions that are out there that are um, posing an immediate threat and need to be addressed right away, and we can't wait for that six to eight month period to go through, then we can immediately, we can bypass all those notice requirements and we can send something immediately to the Attorney General's office. And a good example of that is if there's a train derailment or there's a chemical plant that has an explosion or something like that, um, we don't wanna wait for that. We wanna make sure that, uh, that there's an immediate response and we wanna make sure that people follow through quickly. So we will send a, what we, sort of a letter referral to the Attorney General's office and then they'll move right away. The last type of thing that we have, and this is relevant obviously to this discussion, is something called a seal order. The standard for that is very similar to that immediate injunction that I talked about that we send to the Attorney General's office. Immediate threat, something that is, is going on right away and needs to be addressed right away. The difference there is um, we have the ability on our own to basically seal off either a vessel, a uh, piece of equipment, a um, you know, mobile, piece of mobile transportation, or a site, or a building, depending upon the nature of the, the problem. We don't do that very often because it's a very high standard, and uh, once that happens, it triggers a lot of litigation, and so we need to make sure that we uh, have, um, you know, all the, the, the circumstances truly warrant that as opposed to sending something to the Attorney General's office. Now, I, those are all relevant because you've obviously heard of seal orders. And um, we did issue a seal order down in Willowbrook against Sarah Jennings. Uh, I'm going to get to the, actually, let's see. If I can get to that one. <coughs> so let me, I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about that seal order. Let's sort of talk about the timeline of how we, we got to that point. Um, so this was all triggered a few years ago when the CPA, through their periodic review, uh, made a determination through their review of technical information that the manner in which uh, ethylene oxide, or ETO, was classified needed to be changed. It had been regulated for a very long period of time as a suspected human carcinogen. And when they conducted a review, the most recent review of the database, they uh, changed their classification for that and they made the determination that it was a known human carcinogen. Now, the impact of that 
typically is this. And this is where this case begins to be a little bit different from how these cases usually go. Um, ethylene oxide is regulated as something we call the hazardous air pollutant, or a HAP. We have a lot of acronyms in environmental law, and I apologize, but <laughs> it's a HAP, it's an HAP. And that is something that is a federal determination, and it's regulated by a federal standard. And that federal standard is a national emission standard for hazardous air pollutant, or NES, HAP, NESHAP. <coughs> so there is a NESHAP for ethylene oxide. Now the thing about that NESHAP standard is, the NESHAP that exists right now for commercial sterilizers, for example, is a requirement on how effective the control device is that you've got that's cleaning out that ethylene oxide before it gets emitted to the atmosphere. So in other words, you, you, you've got a plant, you've got a staff, you are emitting ethylene oxide, you have some piece of control equipment that is filtering out and capturing that ethylene oxide. The NESHAP, the PTO, says you have to have a certain percentage of capture from that device. It does not say you can only emit so much in a year. It does not say you can only use so much in a year. It does not say what type of equipment you have to use. It simply says you have a percent, uh, percentage control efficiency requirement on that device. Now, uh, US EPA is obligated by, by law to review those NESHAP standards on a periodic basis. They are in the process of doing that right now. And my, my guess is that the uh, reclassification of ethylene oxide and then the follow-up testing that they did down in DuPage, and, and the way they did that, as uh, the senator alluded to, was they took a look nationwide at the uh, facilities that they felt were having an impact, uh, a more pronounced impact on the communities, and they went out to those communities, I, I can't remember if it was five or seven, and they conducted this type of testing. Typically what you see is, or what you would expect is, this is testing that was done in furtherance of their idea that they are reviewing and revising that niche app. As a matter of fact, all the work that they've done, this is what that's gonna to go to. Oftentimes, you don't see this sort of behind the scenes stuff until they've made the revision, they put that proposed rule, that proposed standard, in uh, what's called the Federal Register, which is a federal document, it's a, it's a periodical type thing, that contains all their proposed rules and provides opportunity for comment and so forth. That's typically where you see all that information coming in because what they'll say is, we're revising the, the ETO niche app. We're gonna add the following two, three different types of additional controls. Here's why we're doing it, because we've done studies and we've done this and we've done that. What happened here is the studies and the work that they were doing uh, sort of became the focal point as opposed to the end point. And and that's fine, and I think that's important because the results were, frankly, very troubling. And so I think it was important for the public to understand what those were. But you also have to sort of understand from a regulatory perspective, that did make for a, a complicated regulatory scheme. Because now what you almost have is this. You have a situation where whenever you're going to have a regulation to, to, to regulate something, you've got some rationale behind it. Well, your rationale has changed, but your standard hasn't caught up yet and they're still working on catching that stand up. And that standard has not caught up yet. The last, uh, they had initially believed that they would be coming out with revisions to that, uh, to the ETO NESHAP in summer of 2019. We're now in fall of 2019. They have not come out with that yet. Um, and then the, there are different types of ethylene oxide NESHAPs. The one that uh, people have been looking at with a great deal of detail uh, is one that applies to commercial sterilizers, but there are other types. My understanding is the commercial sterilizer NESHAP is not going to be one of the first ones that they revise. So we're going to have to wait a little while to see what it is that they ultimately come out and decide is appropriate for, uh, for revision. So part of that is, I did not mean to be talking this long, I'm going to pick it up, but under this federal approach, so they take a two-step approach. They assess the problem. That's all that they've done so far. The testing, the con consultation with ATSDR, the gathering of data. And then they conduct their rule review. They have said very publicly, and, and they have been very consistent about this, they do not put themselves in the position to address immediate impacts. They leave that to the state and local authorities to do because they believe they can act quicker than the federal government can. And on the one hand, I think that's correct. We can act quicker, and if you look at what the state of Illinois has done, they have, we have, 
but it also makes it very difficult because much of this regulation of these hazardous air pollutants is done by federal standard. And there's almost an acknowledgement that that federal standard is outdated, so the state is left to fashion their own way. And that's a difficult thing because these are standards that require a great deal of risk, risk work, a great deal of uh, analysis on a national basis, things that individual state agencies typically just don't have the resource uh, ability and the bandwidth to handle. Um, having said that, I think the state of Illinois has responded in, you know, great, and that's the slide of this. But so we were left with having to try and respond to this. So our, our agency respond, has responded in a number of ways. Go back to those three things, permitting, uh, legislation, or regulations, and enforcement. Um, School of Enforcement first, because that's what happened first. We sent a referral to the Attorney General's office last year, in fall of 18, um, asking them to take steps to try and bring sterogenics in, have a discussion, and we needed to basically try and figure out what an appropriate technical remedy is. When we refer cases, we are typically looking for two things. Technical remedy, that's our biggest concern, because technical remedy is what's gonna bring a facility back into compliance and if necessary, some kind of punitive thing. A civil penalty, a monetary penalty, things like that. We were, our primary concern was we want to get a technical fix in place. This stuff is killing us, and you're exposing this to death. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Excuses, yeah. you're making yeah. excuses here. Yeah. Shut down, yeah. we don't want to hear this bull crap from you bureaucrats. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Please remember the tenor for this evening. We are going to have civil dialogue. Please. Well, I, and I apologize. I, I don't mean to do that. And, and but, but let me. I understand your point. And actually, that is exactly what you're saying is exactly what I was trying to do. Probably to death. I, I get that. My point is this. I understand that there's a great deal of sentiment and, and question as to why aren't why won't you just shut the facility down? Just shut them down. Just make them stop. So, so please, please, sir, we are taking questions from the microphone in order, not from the audience with people yelling it out. Thank you. So the answer to that question is, it's what I said before. We cannot do anything that we're not legally authorized to do. If we have evidence, if we have uh, technical evidence that we can provide to the Attorney General's office or that we can front on our own, then we can take those steps. If we don't have that, we don't have the ability to do that. People have said, you know, there, there's a, there, you know, I think there was a question about, well, can we ban the use of ethylene oxide in the state of Illinois? That can be done, but it can't be done by an administrative agency because we don't have the authority to do that. We, we simply are not legally able to do that. We could write a piece of paper and say, we hereby ban the use of ethylene oxide in the state of Illinois. It means nothing. It has no legal value whatsoever. The General Assembly makes laws that we implement. They've done a good job of trying to do exactly what you're talking about, trying to find a way to restrict and put limitations on the uh, ability of, for companies to use ethylene oxide. But from the Illinois EPA's perspective, we cannot shut a plant down simply because they're using a chemical that we don't like. I, I don't know. It, you would have to look to see what other states have author what authorities they have, what legal abilities they've got. I, I, what I'm telling you is what we have in the state of Illinois. So, just just a moment, please. We're not going to be shouting questions from the audience. Let's get to the questions. Please. Do you want us? Shall Shall we move to the questions? Are there, just a moment, please. I, I did not set up the agenda for tonight, and I want to be sure that we're following it with what people have been told. Is there another speaker that is lined up to so follow you? Well, I, obviously, I, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to uh, roll and push the rest of my time. I don't want to speak for uh, Dr. Johnson and Captain College from ATSDR. They may have information they'd like to provide to you, so you know, I, I'm happy to, uh, I, I will cease my comments. Thank you. Um, maybe a show of hands. Would you rather ask your questions of this speaker now? Um, and we can do that and then hear ATSCR, or shall we wait till they're all done? So, if you'd like to ask questions now, you've got about 15 more minutes um, for ATSCR to do their presentation. So, someone who, anybody who wants to ask questions now, raise your hands. I do. 
Okay, well, thanks for democracy. We're going to wait until we're done with ATSCR. Thank you. Uh, GI effects, nausea and vomiting, 
And if there's direct skin contact, you can actually get frostbite from that contact. But again, this, this is more of a worker scenario, not likely to occur in communities where you're affected by the, the, the release into the ambient air. What we're most concerned about, though, is, is long-term effects at lower concentrations that are related to also to neurological effects, evidence of reproductive effects, uh, and also with cancer as a result of long-term exposure that have been uh, identified based on studies of workers in the sterilization industry that have looked at non-Hunter's lymphoma, myeloma, lymphocytic leukemia, and breast cancer in females as evidence of an association of exposure ethanol oxide with, um, with those specific types of cancer. Now, in terms of the Lake County evaluation, um, one of the things that we've realized there's some misunderstanding about information from EPA's native report, the National Air Toxic Assessment, that um, it's dated 2014 because that's when the data was collected, but the report was released in 2018 last summer. And there's been, because of the maps that are in that report, led to a lot of confusion in the part of the public about how to interpret that information. But basically, EPA uses this as a tool then to look at um, ongoing exposure from uh, modeling and emissions from a large number of, of industrial sources across the country and use that information then to predict what is the uh, exposure to chemicals in the environment and based on the census tract uh, and what is the risk of that exposure uh, to communities. It, it's a screening tool that's used by regulatory agencies to decide where we need to look more closely, where there may be a need for more enforcement action to address exposures uh, in specific areas, in specific uh, industrial facilities. These are theoretical cancer risks. They're not measured cancer. Uh, and it's used as a tool then to make decisions, uh, to help support decision making. And it does not estimate individuals' risk of cancer. Uh, again, this is uh, perhaps a misunderstanding of way uh, how we interpret these maps. Uh, and the final point is it's not a display of cancer cases. It's not a measurement of disease in the community. Uh, and it's, it's not a demonstration of cancer cluster, which I think people perhaps have uh, misunderstood some of those. Uh, and that's why we want to get to this point. The only way to actually measure cancer incidence in community is through the cancer registry. And the state health department is involved in reviewing uh, incidence in community of cancers that relate to potential exposure. And they're in the process of looking at additional data collected uh, they've done the initial study in sterogenics and Willowbrook, uh, and we're looking at other sources across the state then to look at uh, other communities and the impact of the exposure. So some preliminary data from the Lake County, and this is uh, according through uh, well, Keegan and Bernie and the Lake County Health Department. Uh, we've reviewed that initial data, which has been posted on their website, uh, in which uh, samples were collected between June 6th and July 4th of 10 locations uh, near the Medline and Vantage facilities. Um, and that's a, the information that from that is, is we view that as screening data. It's really a sort of initial view of the concentration of ethanol oxide at specific locations around those facilities. But it's not useful for us to look at long-term exposure. And that's why we've been supportive of the additional sampling that's going to be initiated this month and continue for some period of time to better characterize these exposures in the communities than we have currently. Uh, this is a summary then of the locations of with the air monitoring stations, the Vantage facility up here, and then four stations uh, downstream or downwind from that, uh, and then the Medline facility here with uh, four stations uh, downwind, and then also two more remote locations that we're looking at potential background or what would be the uh, area, or the, the concentration of ethanol oxide in areas not likely to be impacted by those two facilities. So this is a summary of the um, data presented in a time frame looking at uh, specific locations that are showing from, this is the uh, M3 location, which is the closest to Medline. This is showing the concentration at each of these time points through that month-long period. You see a pretty good variability, but it's in the, high, the highest concentration we found were at this location. And as you move further away from top to bottom here, 
then the, the uh, levels flatten out. Uh, there are some spikes that we don't that may reflect the impact of the wind direction on that day that have been moving from the, that facility towards the assembly point. Um, and this is from, that's looking uh, to the east and northeast. This is looking to the northwest. Uh, again, sort of flat line with some uh, spikes. This happened to be um, within the school. This is a location that we would expect to be a significant distance, about five miles away from these facilities. We don't really have an explanation for that spike. Uh, and that's the other reason for additional monitoring to better characterize uh, concentrations of, of that ethyl oxide in, in various locations. Uh, this is uh, similar um, for the Vantage facility, which lower levels generally, but there, there are some spikes that um, we would want to characterize further. Another issue that we've discovered both in um, looking at the Sterodent facility in Willowbrook is this issue of background. Uh, much of the information about this is sort of buried in various reports, and Michelle's been looking at uh, various uh, documents uh, that uh, various state agencies across the U.S. have been, have been monitoring graphene oxide uh, in their ambient air monitoring plan, but have never really paid much attention to it. And so what we find is that in looking at this data that is on from the East Coast, from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, to uh, Illinois, and Michigan, and uh, Colorado, and then West Coast and California, that there seems to be this background level that's, these are measurements away from any known source. So the question is, where is this coming from? And what we found is that these are fairly low levels, but detectable, 0.1 to 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, the levels we're seeing here, and also in surgenics, are above that, but there's this baseline that we don't clearly understand. It may be the result of uh, long-range sources, industrial sources elsewhere in, around the country that mix in the atmosphere because it's very stable. And no matter where you sample, you see these low levels that even if you're not near a, a sterilization facility, these are the levels you might expect to find in an ambient air. And so we encourage the EPA to look in this more closely to try to characterize where these long-range sources are that are contributing to this background. Area. But we believe that it's, it is, in fact, main major industrial sources. So the work we're doing now in Lake County, we're reviewing the initial data set that I mentioned. Uh, we're um, working with EPA and the Lake County Health Department to help this next phase of, of sampling to better characterize levels of, uh, of ethanol oxide uh, at these uh, first locations. And then once we have that information, then to issue a report then that summarizes these findings, uh, our conclusions and regarding the health impacts of that exposure and making specific recommendations uh, about further actions. Um, so some key points, maybe I'll just go through them very quickly. This is just a snapshot in time. We're looking at long-term averaging or measurements of exposure to look at uh, health effects. We don't find evidence that there is an immediate health threat. These are not levels that would be associated with immediate uh, acute effects that I mentioned. Um, but we want to have more information that gives us more of a, a long term over months and years of, of uh, duration. And also the final point about background. So here's a summary, kind of on color, something like that. Um, these are resources that you can get more information. We have gone through this very quickly. The Lake County Health Department has on their website uh, very informative uh, links to various information about ethanol oxide. US EPA has technical information about ethanol oxide. And also FAQs, which you might find very interesting, might like help answer questions that maybe we can't get to today. Uh, LIPA and uh, H is going to have additional resources that are available to you to gather more information. And then uh, move on to the questions. So I just want to say I saw some of you try to take photos of the screen. Um, with your permission, we will be posting these um, on our website. We'll make sure that they're available for Stop ETO also so that you can post the information. Thanks. Okay, we've randomly selected from those submitting questions three questions. 
Also, they're simultaneously broadcasting for uh, the town hall in Waukegan. So we will address these two questions in the audience, and then we will take one electronically submitted from Waukegan. So the first person on the list is Leanne De Baker. We also have Chris Smith and Pat O'Keefe. Would you please come to the first thing? One more time, we have Pat O'Keefe, Chris Smith from Berlin, and Pat Keefe from Waukegan, and Leanne Baker from Waukegan as well. Hello, I'm Pat O'Keefe. I'm a resident of Waukegan and a neighbor, uh, I'm sorry to say, of a number of breast cancer survivors so far. Uh, and I've noticed that uh, some are. Uh, downwind of these two facilities in places like North Chicago and Waukegan. But uh, I'd like to speak tonight as the president of the Early Childhood Community Coalition of Lake County and address the uh, health of children. Uh, our group, just for information purposes, uh, is made up of parents, grandparents, citizens, and uh, importantly, uh, people who provide child care and early learning to, uh, from infancy through toddlerhood and preschool years and then into the primary grades. And our members are from throughout Lake County. Uh, so what's top of mind to me is uh, children, including infants and toddlers, who's, uh, who will have the longest term uh, impact from uh, the pollution caused by certain plants. And if you could, uh, anyone who uh, is willing to address this, what particular uh, steps can child care providers, parents, grandparents, uh, take for young children uh, looking forward to their uh, whole life facing the possibility of leukemia, lymphoma, etc., even uh, breast cancer that won't be noticed for perhaps decades. Uh, and uh, is there anything in the law or in your agency's purview that allows you to take particular concern with the health of young children. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, so I'll answer the question regarding uh, how we assess children's exposure. So we do know that for chemicals like ethanol oxide that is uh, carcinogenic, it actually operates by what we call a mutagenic or DNA damaging mechanism uh, that we clearly understand that children's exposure is more severe, perhaps, than for adults, because they have developing uh, organ systems, they're more sensitive to the effects of this type of mechanism of action, uh, causing mutations, and so our assessments that are inclusive and in, uh, judicial um, protections uh, for considering in, when there's exposure to children. So it is something very something we're sensitive to, and make sure that when we make decisions about assessing and making recommendations for action that we are in fact sending the checks on children. I'll, I'll just say from a regulatory perspective, we don't have uh, a different or a sliding scale or different set of regulations depending upon the, um, the age of the populace. I would like to answer the, that's the question. This is an important question. This is a, excuse me, sir, I have no, a legal no, opinion no, here no, about sir, the settlements that the lawyer is doing hardly victims. Excuse me, so excuse me, excuse me, sir. Sir, if you've written your question, sir, sir, I believe we've spoken to you earlier. Will you please have a seat? Will you have a seat? If you would like to wait and have your question answered, we will be happy to. Can you please sit down? Your question will be answered when your card is pulled. Thank you. 
I, I, what I was going to say was those types of uh, what Dr. Johnson referred to and, and the, the concerns you raised. Those are taken into consideration when standards are developed, really so hand that hand you hand have hand one hand standard hand that you apply, but it's intended to address the, the the range of the populace that could be impacted. My name is Chris Smith from Gurney. Um, I probably should have a 24-hour rule because I'm just like going to jump at you guys, but I know you don't make the rules. And or if, or, yeah, you don't make the rules, you just enforce them. But you had made a comment that, you know, what's happening around us right now is not um, of great concern or, or an emergency's sake. But how can you say that? You don't know that for a fact, that it's not an emergency. Stereogenics was shut down. Not quite sure why everything's keeping status quo here in Gurney, uh, in the Gurney area with Medline and Vantage. But um, my question is going to this NADA maps. Um, you talk about non-cancer areas and then theoretical cancer areas. I mean, what, what was the purpose of the MIPS if you're not looking at areas that are more prone to cancer because of ETO emissions? What were they for if you can't make a conclusion from those maps? Maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but everything was theoretical cancer or non-cancer. Why isn't it cancer and non-cancer? Okay, <clears throat> so Meta, and I know it's really confusing because they show them in census tracts, right? So you're referring to the maps that are online in the NADA website where they have the blue, darker blue and lighter blue. And so what they're doing is they're taking this risk, they're taking a unit risk that they have calculated based on this greater potency that that um, can mentioned earlier. Michelle, I'm sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your answering. Um, we've had some people say they're having trouble hearing. Oh, okay. So if we could um, just try to speak a little louder and, and let us know if that helps. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So what they do, what EPA does, is they calculate risk based on these inhalation unit risk factors. And they do that across census tracts. That's why there's not a gradation in those maps. It's the entire census tract is dark blue or middle blue or light blue. The reality is the risk is going to be different depending on where you are in that census tract, but they normalize it. There's a centroid, they call it a centroid. It's a middle point in the middle of the census tract, and that's the entire census tract is going to normalize to that. So it's, it's a theoretical risk. I know that sounds like bureaucratic speak, but it's a way for them to prioritize what areas of the country they're going to focus their regulatory action on and to look closer at facilities that are causing elevated risk. And risk is different than actual incidents. So a risk is you may have a greater chance of getting cancer if you're exposed to these concentrations, whereas incidents is what IDPH would be investigating if they were to go and pull records of everybody who was diagnosed with various cancers in this area, that's an instance study, whereas NADA is more of a, they're calculating a risk number, and it is not the number of actual people who have been diagnosed with cancer. So they're two different things. One's a tool for regulatory action. One of them is a public health uh, that we become really aware of populations that are overly, ex have been disproportionately exposed to these types of pollutants. And so, um, I know now, as Mark mentioned, that IEPH is looking at this in other places. Other states are also looking to recreate similar investigations, like in Georgia and other places where there are sterilizers. But it's it's a it's kind of a new. Um, unfortunately, it's something that. But did, but did those maps show like areas that were like they show medical cancer? They they show areas where there's a risk that's highest, and the risk has been calculated to be highest. And you can go in and you can look at the maps and see which facilities are the ones that are contributing that risk. Sometimes ETO is the major source of the risk, and sometimes it's because it's near an airport or it's because it's near some other facility that's emitting pollutants. It may be that it's not just ETO, sometimes it's other pollutants as well, other hazardous air pollutants. So it really depends. I think the, the 25 sites that, that Dr. Kim mentioned are ones that are affected primarily by ETO that they're looking at right now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leanne Baker from Waukegan. Thank you for the opportunity to ask our questions. Um, 
as you showed in your slide, sir, you said that the IEPA is there to enforce um, the legal allowable limit is less than or equal to 0 0.02. Your slide said about enforcement, which to me is quality assurance. A third party was hired to come in and do the testing. How come we found out about this so late and how come the IEPA isn't doing the, the testing and the quality assurance because they're the ones that are supposed to be enforcing it? So uh, that's a good question. The, the point zero 0.02 number that you're referencing is not a an enforceable number. It, it's not a number that we can go into court or we can ask the Attorney General's office to go into court and say they are above this number and so you need to enforce it. It's not a regulatory number. It's a guidance number that they've used and, and, and that they're drawing back from when they've conducted their risk assessment. Okay, but if something te tests at 10.0, that's 9.98 .9 above the point zero 0.02. That is baffling to me. I can't. I can't get on board with that. Yeah, I understand. The is there high a numbers. regulatory number? Pardon me. Is there a regulatory number? No, that's what I was saying before. When I was describing what the NESHAP number is, that's the, the regulatory number. There is no regulatory number. The numbers that you're talking about are numbers that UCPA is generating as part of their review in terms of whether or not they're going to propose a regulatory number. But there is right now no enforceable number that exists at the federal level. That's the There's point. no number. What's the point? Yeah. Oh, are you supposed to be protecting us? Yeah. Oh. I mean, not you specifically, but the IEPA. No, no, no. no I, I understand. So that, that's what I'm saying. This is what I was trying to refer to before when I said it, it makes it difficult for us because there is no regulatory number. It's a very good question. There's no regulatory number for us to enforce. It would be much easier, obviously, if we had a number in the rules that we could say, you are required to exceed no more than this and you've done that. So what we've had to do and what we've done in the state is we have basically, by, through, uh, through permitting action on our part, and as has been codified at the state level in legislation, we have created our own set of requirements they're not a regulatory number that you're describing because we don't have the, you know, uh, Dr. Johnson and Michelle were referring to, the generation of that type of number takes a long time from a scientific standpoint. So what we've done instead is we created a series of technical requirements, engineering requirements that have to be met for them to operate. And what we've done then is those were not just sort of by happenstance. Those were designed specifically with the idea that if you model the emissions, that would result when you have the, that type of equipment in line, you will bring that risk factor down to very close to what US EPA is basing that 0 0.02 number off of, which is, someone said before, the risk level that is sort of the action level for US EPA is 100 in a million. When you get to above 100 in a million, that's what they, that, that's that heightened risk that they're concerned about. And the, the report that was generated, and if I get the number wrong, I'm sorry, but I believe the report that was generated in for Willowbrook was something like a six and 10,000 for residential, which would equate to something like a 600 and a million. The whole point behind our actions from a permitting standpoint and what's in the legislation is to bring that number down to our, our modeling demonstrates that from Medline, it would be between, depending upon what height stack you have, five to seven in a million, as opposed to the 600 and a million that you were seeing at Sterogenics. And it's five to seven, well below the 100 million that is US EPA's action level. So we don't have a regulatory number, but what we did was we modeled back and we required these things, these the this permanent total enclosure, the additional controls, the, the monitoring, so that we could say the emissions are going to be dropped so low that that's the resulting risk that we would see. There is no safe level. I, the next question is electronically submitted from Waukegan. This question is from Edgar Sandoval of Waukegan. How will there how will there be meaningful community participation with state and federal agencies beyond interacting and lobbying elected officials when it comes to tackling this issue? And what will it look like? So I can tell you from the state's perspective, the uh, again the, the the direct means that we have in terms of regulation is what I said before, it's permitting. And what we do before we issue a permit is we conduct a town hall meeting or a public meeting. We, we did that 
uh, earlier this year for uh, in Waukegan for Medline. We did that in uh, Willowbrook for Sterigenics. That is our means of bringing in public uh, comment and public input before we issue a permit. If you are talking about rules, the rulemaking process is set up because it's required that there are a number of hearings that are held by the Illinois Pollution Control Board where the public can come in and make comments. And as I mentioned before, before we do any formal rule proposal, we typically go out and we will engage the public and have some listening sessions or some outreach where we will take informal comments in that way to help us develop what it is we're going to do when we propose the rule. Uh, legislation, I, I think it's, you know, what, what someone noted, you, you reach out to your legislators, you talk to them, you express your concerns, and then they, they go from there. I, I can't speak to the step that USC data would be taking. Can I, can I um, step in real quick? I don't think we did a good job of completely um, answering your concern, ma'am, over here. Oh, the, oh the so, so when you're talking about the action level, 100 million is the equivalent, I think, is of the point of two. I think that's what, what you were getting at, right? So, so I think when you're talking about action, that's how it was that they decided which of these, these areas of the country to actually investigate. So that was their action, is to go in and look at who else, what, what additional regulations or how, um, what other facilities need to be evaluated more and maybe have additional enforcement and work done to reduce their emissions. I was really concerned about the testing. Why wasn't testing done to see if to, to enforce something, you have to test it to make sure they're, that they're doing it, right? right? That was my other question I wanted to I can't speak to all the facilities, but I know um, Dr. Kim can talk to you about how they did some of the stack tests and some other things here. They've done some intermediate air testing. We've got some additional intermediate air testing here. So there, there is an interest in looking at these sites. In Illinois, of course, we have these, these really more stringent regulations in other places, but in other states, they're looking at these facilities more closely also. But it's driven by risk, so they, they figure out where they're going to look by calculating the risk number, and if that risk number is more than 100 in a million, then they look at additional regulations in that state, so, and in that location, at that facility. So I hope, I'm trying to... How do they know the risk number if they're not testing? That's, they're not, obviously, Medline Advantage so, wasn't tested here. Right, that, no, that's a good question. So the, the way that's done is, both at the federal level and the state level, you conduct a modeling exercise, and what that means is, you take inputs, you, you, uh, for example, um, you, if, let's say this Medline, you take a look at the characteristics of the facility. How tall are the stacks? How many stacks do you have? What's the diameter? What are, what's the, the velocity of emission going through there? You, you take a look at all these inputs, and, and uh, if I get this wrong, Kevin, correct me, but you take a look at all these inputs, and you basically run a mathematical uh, uh, modeling exercise, and you use that to determine what you expect to see. That is how, that's what's done uh, by USCK when they generate rules, it, taking into account, as Michelle said, the risk associated with that, and that's what, that is the exercise that we did when we took a look at, uh, and, and the way we do it is we regulate emissions from point of source. So what we did is we, we are focused primarily on what is actually coming out of the smokestack at the facility, and that's what we measure, because uh, ambient air monitoring is, is helpful, and it, it, it does give you some indication. It's very useful for risk work, but from our perspective, we want to know exactly what is coming out of that facility. Because as was noted, when you talk about background, it, it's difficult to determine what all the sources are when you take a background sample. But if we have our monitors at the point of emission at the facility, we know exactly what is coming out of the facility, and that's the information we use to run our modeling exercises so that we can see if they have gotten to the point that we want them to get to. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pat. Another point that we've uh, identified is that uh, the that modeling exercise needs to consider the contribution of fugitive emissions, not just what's coming out of the stacks. Because that can also be a significant source of exposure if that's not controlled. So that's one of the things that has led us to make recommendations for your monitoring so that can be evaluated and included in our assessment of health impact. Thank you. Just a, I know. But, and that's a good point, too, but that's, this has come up as well. Fugitive emissions, uh, Dr. Johnson is exactly right. When you're talking about the emissions, what you want to do is you want to make a determination as to what the emissions are from the source. You have the, the point of emission from a stack, but then you have what are called fugitive emissions, the emissions that are sneaking out through you know, cracks in the walls, through open doors, what have you. 
Um, one of the specific things we wanted to do, because it's difficult to measure fugitive emissions because you're trying to filter out with the environment what you believe is coming from that facility. And generally speaking, what they do is these facilities will try and run a sort of, uh, they'll, they'll assign a number. They'll say, well, we estimate it's approximately this. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to take that issue off the table. And that's why what is found in the legislation and what's found in our permits is a requirement for something called permanent total enclosure or a capture and control. And what that does is that creates a system, and this is not a novel thing. This is something that's done already in facilities that we regulate and it's done across the country. But what it does is it creates what we call a, basically a, a, a negative pressure. So it, it's basically you're, you've got a vacuum inward. So you do not have those fugitive emissions because you have set up a system within your facility that you are drawing those emissions in. So you take the, you, then you can take the requirement or the, the problem of measuring fugitive emissions off the table because you've captured all those emissions and they're now going to be routed through and controlled. So it's a good point that that's a very difficult thing to measure. That's why that was one of the key points that we raised uh, in terms of requirements for facilities going forward. The next three uh, people are Ryan Lake, I hope I pronounced it correct correctly, uh, from Grace Lake, Tatiana Santamaria, and Barb Hernandez from Gurney, and Tatiana is from Gurney as well. Please come up. Hi, I'm Barb Hernandez from Gurney, and um, I wanted to thank Melinda Bush for for hosting this and setting it up and for all the support that we've had. So, and my question, if it's okay to ask Melinda, is um, we're excited about these two new bills that have been introduced in the um, House, the Illinois House, which would be 3888 and 3885. And of course, um, just for people who don't know, if I may, just say that uh, 3888 ensures that by 2021, that there be no sterilization facilities emitting ETO within a five mile radius uh, distance from the school, daycare, or a densely populated area. Um, and then it goes on with uh, hospitals with phasing out the ETO sterilization by 2022 and uh, critical asset access hospitals would phase out by 2025. And then all other emitters would have a cap of 30 pounds annual um, uh, emissions. House Bill 3885 would give home rule municipalities the authority to ban ETO emissions within their borders. So um, what we would like to ask Melinda Bush, if you would if these bills make it through the House and they come your way into the Senate, will you help support those bills and help get them passed through the Senate as well? Thank you. I want to say thank you for the question. I didn't really want to answer those kind of questions tonight because otherwise we have all these legislators, I'm sure, that would like to speak. You know, whatever comes over. So both of those bills have been introduced. Have we're just filed. Thank you. Uh, we're just filed in the House. They have not been introduced. Um, so they're still a work in progress also. Um, and if those bills do get through the House, obviously, those bills will be worked on in the Senate. Um, so there will be hearings in the House, um, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Else has come up, which of course I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's a subject matter hearing, and we'll get them at the end. Okay. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Ryan, uh, Ryan Leaf. I live in Grays Lake and I attend the College of Lake County. Um, so, this was Strategetics in Willowbrook? Um, yeah, so I was curious as to this particular chemical is used to treat medical instruments, uh, surgical tools, and some produce. Uh, is there any particular reason why this particular chemical is used if it poses such a health risk to people in general? Is it generally so what we know in terms of why it's used by the commercial sterilizers is uh, that um, 
basically it, it, it makes it um, more efficient for them. And, and I think, and I, and I don't, well, again, I, I, I don't know the, I'm just relaying what we've been told because we don't regulate the uh, sterilization activity. That's something that the Food and Drug Administration does. They, the Food and Drug Administration is the entity, the federal agency, that approves or uh, gives a sign off to different types of uh, sterilization. What I have been told, what I've read, and what people here probably know, the, the, the difference of this distinguishing factor with ethylene oxide is it penetrates packaging, it penetrates uh, plastic and things like that, and so you can have a pallet of devices that are wrapped, manufactured, wrapped, put together, and then they can be uh, sterilized with ethylene oxide because it will penetrate that packaging, as opposed to if you use a different means, you do it pre-packaging, and then you have to package, and then you do it that way. That, that's our understanding. So is that just for the sake of an economical <coughs> purpose for packaging simplicity? Yeah. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. 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 yeah, well, they're well, and again, this is not something that our agency <coughs> regulates, but I, I, from what I've read and from what I've heard, that there are, you know, it's a different type of, it's a low heat application, there are different types of applications. Uh, I honestly don't know, because this is not something we regulate, I don't know if every device that is regulated, that's, uh, that's sterilized with ethylene oxide could not be sterilized with some other means. It, it might be possible. I know the Food and Drug Administration has issued notices saying that they're looking into that, but again, that, that's something that is a federal action and it's not something that is done at the state level, by any state. Yeah, to add to that, so we know that of the medical supplies that are sterilized, 50% uh, of them use ethylene oxide as the sterilization uh, agent. The other 50% is radiation. So the FDA, and, and out of this concern about the emissions and exposure to ethylene oxide in communities, has initiated uh, an innovation challenge to the industry to look at alternatives identify where there might be an opportunity and then we should look for other methods of sterilization that would not necessarily have the same risk uh, ethanox poses. There might end up being some materials, some packaging that may still require that, which will require some additional actions on the part of regulatory agencies to control those emissions. But I think the movement is to look for alternatives as a means of replacing ethanox for when it can be replaced. Thank you. My name is Tatiana Santamaria from uh, Gurney. My question is, um, we already know Vantage installed their um, scrubbers, but their emissions, their emissions are still high. And we have a school half a mile from Vantage facility, Spalding Elementary School. Uh, what is the next step for Vantage to do in this case? The, the next step from a technical perspective is um, well, and I, I think they're, I'll, I'll say this, so from the, the next step that we're going to be taking, that will be public facing, is uh, we're going to conduct a series of permit transactions with Vantage. And we're hoping to have something uh, put out to public notice in the next, hopefully in the next month or so, which will be a, uh, the first of a couple of permit transactions, which will memorialize and uh, update their permits to reflect, among other things, the, the addition of the scrubbers that you mentioned. Because of the specifics of that type of facility and the type of permit that they had, they, as opposed to the other sterilizers or the other operations, they did not need to have a permit issued prior to them actually doing the, the uh, installation because it was sort of, it's a different setup. It's a different physical setup. Kevin knows this much better than I do. But uh, the 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 information that we believe is out there, and they continue to work on this because we have not issued a draft permit, we have not gone forward with that. But um, the point with what they've done is, it should be, and they're gonna have to demonstrate to us, and we'll, again, conduct these modeling exercises, it, it, we need to get that facility having the same impact as what we're seeing with the other facilities that were regulated. That's our end goal. I'm not sure what else I can. Thank you, but if there is, an, there is no a regulatory number, um, how are they going to comply with the new standard? And did you say there's a month from now that they will be taken care of? I, I think, yeah, we're, uh, we have a number of actions we're trying to put out to public notice. We're sort of, I don't want to 
you know, it, it's not a hard target, but we're trying to get that out as soon as we can. I'm hoping within the next month or so that we'll issue a public notice for the first of a series of permit transactions for Vantage. But to go to your point, you're right. There is no specific regulatory number. There's no statutory number that says you have to do this. There are, in terms of, well, there is a number. Vantage is required based upon legislation that uh, was put through by uh, Senator Bush to do what we have already done with Medline and Sergenics, which is to have an annual emissions cap. In other words, that is a hard number, and that is a number that says, and that's not found at the federal level, that says you cannot emit on an annual basis more than X amount. And that's a purposeful number, because that number is also one of the things that we work back from, from a modeling perspective, to make sure that that risk level that we're, work, that we're identifying is low and is in that acceptable range. So what if it's above the acceptable range? Then what happens to Vantage? Well, if, if, any, if it's, for example, the emissions number, it, it's just the same as any other enforceable number. If they are above that, or if their operations, if their monitoring requirements, you know, they have monitoring requirements, if it shows that things are not going the way they're supposed to, then we can take enforcement action because we have enforceable numbers that are based in law once, yeah, once the permit's issued. But there are statutory requirements as well that, that would be there. So that's correct. The point behind the permit, again, is what I said before. That's our primary means of regulation. That's our direct means of imposing requirements on a facility. That is typically when we're bringing an enforcement action against the facility, that's what we use as our basis because that incorporates all those legal requirements. Thank you. Yep. Why don't you just pass a law letting Medline and Vantage grandfather in? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Hi, I'm Michelle Bowman from Grace Lake. I have a very simple yes or no question. Would you have your family living close to one of these facilities without any fear? Yes or no to each of the panel. Yeah. And I'm walking out of here more scared than I was coming in. Um, it's a yes or no question. That's all I'm asking for. So I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to explain why. Because the purpose behind these permits, as, as Dr. Johnson showed, there is a natural, this is nationwide, and, and, and he's correct, no one exactly knows what the sources are of that background. Level. So no matter where I live, no matter where you live, set aside what, what plants you might have there, there is this naturally existing background level. The point behind our permits, the point behind our permits is to have a situation where the emissions from these facilities are not going to have any impact on what is the existing background level. So the point of the permits is, and this is how they've been modeled, and this is how this is why we have the specific requirements that we have, is that the impact is not going to, it, it, it has literally no impact on the risk number as opposed to what you're finding in background. So if I live in Springfield, Illinois, if you were to put a monitor in my backyard, I have no reason to doubt it would be something between 0.1 and 0.3. And if we have that type of thing here, and you have that facility with the permit requirements that we're going to have on there, the, the emissions are not going to impact the background. I, I don't know what all the different factors are that go into background. That's part of the thing that people are looking into. But what we've done is we have designed these permits so that they will not be increasing the risk compared to what background provides. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. Can I get a yes or no from the rest of the panel? But this is before, before all those things are done. Just, just what I would say is I would be here with you. If I was living in the neighborhood, anybody else on the panel? Yes. Good evening, Thank you. Just, just, just as, just as John said, and I, I also want to reiterate something that Mark had said earlier is. When US EPA puts out these risk numbers, they are not doing it, uh, it it's not a personal risk number. It's, 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 but, but the risk is not a personal risk number, it's a, it's a risk number that's used for regulatory purposes. But it's your family, are you willing to risk your family life? Thank you. Hi, my name is Taya Tanaka. I'm one of the leaders of Stop ATL. We do know where those backgrounds come from. They come from industry. There is 80 million tons of ethylene oxide that is emitted worldwide annually. That is where the 0.1 to 0.3 microgram per meter cube come from. You know that, it's industry. Please do not cover for them. This is not pears ripening, it's not oranges ripening. This is ethylene oxide coming from industrial sources. So that's one comment that I had to, from your answer to the other one. Um, my question was, when has the EPA audited Vantage and Medline last time? What, what do you mean by audited? When was the company, Medline and Vantage, when was the last time that the EPA representative went there to audit them? As, as through an inspection? An inspection. Okay. Um, well, audit seems to have a financial tone to it. What our agency does is we conduct inspections. And, and Kevin can probably speak to the, I don't know if you do know, but, um, okay, May. Um, typically what we do with permitted facilities, depending upon the type of permit, is we have a schedule that we do. And we have a lot of facilities, obviously, that we, we permit statewide, and we focus on the major sources, but we do try and uh, maintain a schedule where we conduct routine inspections. We conduct inspections based upon complaints too. Um, but what we do is those inspections go through, they review records, they review emission data, they review just the So I heard May. May in 2019 was the last time. Is that a good assumption? Yeah, I, first time. Yeah, for the stack. For stack yes. Because fugitive emissions are one of the other emission sources, 
what has the EPA done to uh, inspect fugitive emissions? Well, so the way we're going to inspect fugitive emissions is we're going to enforce the permit, which has a requirement that they How do you enforce a permit if you don't know how you are testing? You, you, if you don't know what you're testing, how do you enforce something that is just in vacuum? No, you're you're taking a self-reported yeah. data. No, no, that's it's a, good, it's a good question. Here's how you here's how you here's how you check to see if a negative pressure system is working. It's you have, the way that works is you have to have a certain pressure differential between the interior of the building and the atmosphere, and you have monitors set up outside the building and inside the building. And who installs those monitors? Who validates those monitors once they're installed? It's not you, it's the company. So you are relying completely on the company giving you information. How do you know that that information is accurate if you're not auditing it? So. <laughs> so what we do is this, and you're right. Ideally, we would go to literally every facility that we permit, and if there was a monitoring requirement for every facility, and, and hundreds of uh, thousands of facilities that have that monitoring or reporting requirement, we would have staff go out and do that. But we don't have the staff to do that. No, no one has the staff to go and do that. So what you do is this. So, so what you're telling me is by not having the staff to do it, you can't do it. No, 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 no. I, if you let me finish. So what you do is this. You set up a you system of requirements that are certifications that are legally binding, that if they're falsified, carry a criminal offense, criminal penalty, and what you do is you, you take that information and you conduct inspections, you review the data that's generated, we, we uh, validate it that way, and you, make, you put the requirement on the company to go out and retain qualified professionals to do the testing for them. When was the last time you tested it? You the haven't. The, the, the permit, my you understanding is that the, that system has not been installed yet because they're still waiting for final appro local approvals to be able to uh, install that. Once it gets installed, and once the system is running, then we will conduct our inspections based upon those readings and based upon the data that they generate required by permit. What I'm hearing is there is no way that the EPA will be able to really know, unless they're testing it, but they can't test because there is no resources, no, no head count no, to go I, and no, test. No, 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 that's, that's what not what I'm hearing. saying. I, and I, I respectfully disagree. I understand what you're saying, but no, that, and I apologize if my point's not coming across. What I'm saying is there are different ways to try and do testing. We don't have the ability, I don't know if any state agency in the country, or for that matter, UCK, that has the ability on their own to go out and do that themselves at every facility they regularly. So since you don't do it that way, you do it a different way. And we do it. And the way you do it is you set requirements by law, by regulation, by permit, upon the regulated entity. And this is, any entity in the state has requirements that are placed upon them that are legally binding on them. That's the price of doing business. And they have to provide that information back to us. We have to validate that. We have to take a look and make sure it's accurate. We'll, that's part of what we do when we go out and we do our inspections. So we do check that and we do we do follow up on that and we do make sure those systems are running and those emissions are where they're supposed to be. We don't do it by sending out our people to go into the facilities and do all that testing on their own because, again, I'm not aware of You do that from auditing. I mean, that, and, that, and that's the inspections that we do. And you're right, we do inspections. And then that is, that is exactly what we do. It's what you're saying. We want to validate that information. We want to make sure that that's accurate. I, if I can add to the comment, to add to the comment about background, so we know that there are different categories of ethanol oxide emitters. We've been talking about Dandridge and Medline here that are users of ethanol oxide. They don't manufacture. Okay. Another, another category would be those facilities that are actually making it and then selling that and then distributing it that. So that's another whole um, industry that we think needs to be looked at as potential large-scale sources, uh, both manufacturing and transportation. No, absolutely. Hi, my name is Carla Esser Lake, and I live here in Grays Lake. And my question is for the, the scientists in terms of ethylene oxide. Um, what other sources, other than the sterilization plants, would ethylene oxide come out of? That's my. That's the question. And also, I have also heard that it's in human breath, and it's in also auto emissions. Is that correct? We 
We know that there's a background uh, in doc what's called endogenous ethanol oxide, that your body manufactures very low levels of ethanol oxide as part of metabolism of certain lipids. And we know that from studies of looking at um, what we call biomarkers of ethanol oxide, that you can measure this in blood of the binding of ethanol oxide to hemoglobin in your blood cells. So we know this is a background level that's occurring endogenously. Um, smokers um, have much higher levels than people who don't smoke. That's a source of exposure that is both uh, those of smokers as well as secondary smoke. Um, again, EPA is looking into these other sources besides um, what we've been talking about in terms of these end users that we think needs to be further characterized, both stationary sources but also mobile sources. Uh, so a lot of this we don't know about, but because of the spotlight that the cancer concerns has raised, it's going to provide the incentive to gather that information. Just to add to that, um, places that you never expected, um, some of the studies of reproductive health effects are dental hygienists, um, people who sterilize equipment. Um, so you might see it in a veterinary clinic or you might see it in a dental office. So these are very small handlers of ETO, but as Taya mentioned, we live in a fishbowl. So Regardless of who's emitting it, it's accumulating in our atmosphere. It's affecting people across the, you know, the world, really. And those are generally unregulated. Uh, they're not really in the category that would require inspections, but they contribute to, to the most atmospheric, but also personal exposures. The next, the next three names to come up uh, a Olivia uh, Moed, I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name, Green Oaks. Um, also, Susan Henry from Gurney, or Hearing from Gurney, the if I got the right, and David Wananitas from Watsworth. Thanks, Greg. Um, so, I actually have several questions. My name is Susan Henning from Gurney. Um, my first question I wrote when I came in here, and now I've heard some different things that uh, will cause me to pose the question in a different way. Uh, the original question was, the testing done this summer showed much higher levels than the EPA's actionable level. What does actionable mean? What should we expect you to take action on? And when a seal order was placed on sterogenics, why not here? Now, obviously, Sterogenics was sh shut down. We know that there was independent testing done that down there, and the levels that you say there are no, right, there's not a regulatory number, but there were levels that were detected, and they were so high that Governor Pritzker stepped in and shut that facility down. So there must be some number. Um, I, I know that there's been some information publicized, this 0 0.02 number, and the testing done this summer showed three at Vantage and 10 at Medline. So what, it, it sounds like a lot of um, runaround talk that you're giving us saying that there's no number, yeah. because there are numbers. Yeah, no, well, so I, I will, I, I think uh, Michelle did a really good job explaining the, what the action level was, and I'll, I'll let her elaborate on that, but, uh, as to sterogenics, you're right, there is no action level. There is no number. This goes back to what I said before. It's a, it, it's a very difficult situation because you don't have an enforceable number. And that's what made that, that handling of that seal order so difficult. But I will tell you this. So what, what distinguishes uh, what was relied upon with sterogenics in terms of the issuance of the seal order were two things. One, it was the information generated in the ATSDR report uh, that was specific to uh, the Willowbrook community and specifically, you know, focusing on the emissions from sterogenics. And two, the village was conducting some uh, some testing and they had a series of two numbers that were that came up. One was 160, one was 60 something. Those were the numbers that caused us to step in because we had literally no explanation as to how those numbers could be that big. And the point behind the steel order was if we are seeing numbers over 150, then we need to step in right now and, and put a brick on this until we can figure out what's going on. But we had been seeing numbers lower. It, it's a very difficult thing. We were seeing lower numbers 
not inconsistent with maybe what we're seeing in, in uh, Waukegan and Gurney. And, and the question becomes, well, you know, what do you do with those numbers? Generally speaking, and I, this is really their domain, not mine. The, the, it's hard to put this into context because the numbers that people are talking about, well, the long-term exposure numbers, it's not a regulatory number that, again, is our typical, our typical thing that we look to a regulation and we look to a specific number. What we did there, though, was because of the uh, information that was drawn from the report and because of those specific numbers that we had seen, that's what caused us to issue the seal over there. Okay, um, I will pose this question to you. The testing that was done this summer here in Gurney and Waukegan uh, was done after Vantage was somehow allowed to put scrubbers in. So wouldn't it be reasonable for me to say, I will never know, I live about a mile and a half from Vantage, I've, I've lived there for 25 years, would it be reasonable for me to say, I will never know what the levels of ethylene oxide are that I have been breathing all of these years? How will I ever know that number? You mean from Vantage? Yes. The source from Vantage? Yes. The inf well, so the, the means that we have been tracking, uh, that we have been uh, tracking the, the emissions from these facilities, and again, what we do is we, we focus on emissions coming from the plant. And um, before we had this heightened risk associated with the reclassification, before we had the information that had been generated and, and sort of assessed through the uh, report that ATSDR prepared, our primary means was through the annual emission reports that are required from the facilities where they report to us how much annually they have emitted. The self-reported numbers. Yes. Yes. Which yeah. are high. Yes, they were. They were They were high, especially in comparison to where we're going to be, you know, if, if you look at the Medline numbers before and after, the serogenics numbers before and after, it's a fraction that they're required to put out now. All I can tell you is prior to that reclassification, all we had to work with was the federal standard. And that standard didn't even apply, didn't, did not have an annual number. So that was something that's generated and only found by requirement in Illinois. No other state has that. So that's why we, 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 can, we, we can only act prospectively. We can't go back and, you know, I can't. I okay, can't. so that actually brings up a very good point of something else that I want to ask about that Taya brought up just a minute ago. So you're going to be permitting Vantage and uh, they are only allowed to have a certain, I, I don't have the language to describe it, but a certain number annual. captured annual numbers. Annual number, yeah. And she indicated that um, there was discussion between the two of you that seemed to indicate that you don't have the manpower to actually um, check those numbers. You said, no, 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 no let me finish. That um, and this is, this is going to be a federal permit. They, Vantage would face violations, um, they would face some sort of penalties if they violated it. But what my, my perspective is, I live there and I breathe this, so if they violate it and you find out after the fact, because obviously you can't find out if they violate it before they violate it. So once they violated it, I have breathed in that amount of ethylene oxide. So I don't understand why that's considered acceptable. I would say it's your In your own words, you said that you would issue a seal order when there is an immediate threat. To me, that's an immediate threat. Yeah. 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 Furthermore, there was an explosion, as I know you know, of a chemical plant very near Vantage just a few months ago. And if that explosion had happened closer to Vantage, and cause Vantage to explode because, as you also know, ETO is extremely flammable. To me, that is an immediate threat. Yeah. Yeah. TRI is toxic release inventory. Well, many of you probably have looked at that online already, but it's it's this self-reported process, and they can validate the records of where they've gotten materials from and all that, so they do some of that. But if you look at any, any of these industries over time, if you look at the NATO report, you'll see the concentrations in air and, and the trends over time. So unfortunately, we are, we, we, we are we're reactive sometimes. So we identify risk and then we try to go back and, and regulate to reduce that risk. 
You're absolutely right. It's a flaw in the way that we do science, but it's unfortunate. We have now identified this risk, and now come the regulations because we've identified a higher risk than we want to see yes. in the air. And let's get it out of our, our neighborhoods and near our schools, please. David Janaitis, uh, Wadsworth, Illinois. Uh, first of all, I, Waukegan and the surrounding communities uh, were in the back. David Janaitis, Wadsworth, Illinois. Uh, first of all, Waukegan and those communities accessing water from the uh, Waukegan water intake has resulted in a cancer hotspot. Uh, and it's been well documented over the past 35 years, especially those children that have resulted in uh, situations with neuroblastoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. And I, I really feel that this type of community action like this and engaging individuals who are involved in it is just so important. It took 20 years to be able to determine that some of those situations of asbestos in the harbor and in resulting in those water intakes resulted in those damages to our children from 40 plus years ago. And I really applaud being here. Uh, secondly, it appears that uh, testing locations were determined by prevailing winds. Since ETO is in fact heavier than air, shouldn't eval uh, elevation be a critical element in determining where to actually uh, establish those testing uh, stations in the future? Now, and I'm sorry, I'm not the modeler, but I did work with the modeler who um, helped Lake County decide where to put these stations. And they do take into account topography, that's part of the model. Um, so what we are trying to do is to give ourselves the best opportunity to find worst case <coughs> exposures or concentrations in air, so that is exactly what they were trying to do with the model. So there is a component of topography in that model. Thank you. Additional question from um, Waukegan. Um, this is from Diana Burdett. The IOEPA webinar for Willowbrook in March, the IOEPA clearly stated that the high levels of ETO had reduced drastically when operations were sealed. This means that background levels have a correlation to the facility. While negative pressure is working for other facilities, has it been tested with such a highly explosive chemical, chemical or are we the test subjects? I, I think the webinar that's being referred to was done by US EPA, not Illinois EPA. So I, I can't speak to the information that they provided. What about the question regarding the, the zero pressure, pressure. And, and are we are we the subjects for this new yeah. negative pressure. process for ethylene oxide? Because as I understand it, that line is the first for ETO. You mentioned that it's being used elsewhere in Illinois and in the country. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the limit that you set for Medline. It certainly is going to help in our area. I live 1.3 miles from Medline, but I, I'm curious what we what we should expect and when we're really going to have some information on those results. Sorry to. Um, I can I can reiterate the question for the panel. While negative pressure is working for other facilities, has it been tested with such a highly explosive chemical, or are we the test subject? The concept of a perimeter total enclosure is, was developed and, and implemented in regulations through the 1990 Clean Air Act, so it's been around a long time. And it, it's dealing with volatile organic chemicals and compounds, specifically like printing operations and dealing with MEK and toluene. So the answer is yes, the perimeter total enclosure has been developed and used in highly toxic in highly explosive environments. With ETO? Specifically with ETO? With other compounds. But not ETO. It, what does it matter if it's ETO or toluene it or methyl, 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 methyl chloride? They're all they're all chemicals. And they're all toxic chemicals but that they all have been used. So what are the other chemicals? 
So the three people that we have coming up next is Melanie Brown, Adrian Doherty. Melanie Brown is from Gurney. Adrian Doherty lists her area of Lake County. And also uh, Demetrio Segrims. I got that right from walking in. I used to be a former teacher. I can be just about anything. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melanie Brown from Gurney, Illinois. Thank you for being here tonight and answering our questions. Um, I just wanted to ask a two-part question, but I wanted to bring up some numbers first. But I feel like we've been dancing around a lot of the numbers tonight, acting like we don't have the numbers to close you down, we don't have the numbers to do this and that. These are the numbers that I have. I know that the EPA estimates that the average cancer risk across the U.S. population is a specifically due to air toxins only, is about 30 in a million. When ETO reaches 0.02, which is the number we've discussed here, that means that the risk is then 100 in a million, or basically a little over three times as much as the average U.S. risk. When the testing was done in Lake County, they found that near Medline, it measured in at a, at a level that actually increased the cancer risk to 50,000 in a million. Compare that to 30 in a million, and you really are going to tell me that you're going to move your family to this area. <laughs> 30 in a million to 50,000 in a million. My question is, our government and our laws are based on presumption. You are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. In terms of health things, the presumption should be on the side of, if we don't know it's safe, it's not going to happen. Willowbrook had the right result. You guys sealed them. I know that within five or ten years, ETO will not be allowed anywhere in the country. You guys are building a legacy right now for yourselves. Where are you going to stand in this? I'm confused how you guys can all stand back and say, Oh, but we don't know exactly, and we don't have this law. If you could seal sterogenics, you can seal Medline. You can seal Medline. Exactly. We don't have the power that we're begging you for our families. We already live here. We don't get the choice of whether to move our families or here. Had I known five years ago when I moved here that I was smack in the middle between Vantage and Medline, I would have never moved here, never in a million years. And I didn't need to help us. in the August report, we reached out to every ETO source in the state. There's an inventory that we have. We reached out to literally every uh, uh, ETO source, and it ranges from sterilizers to manufacturers to hospitals to uh, veterinary clinics to veterinary schools. We reached out to everybody, and we talked to them to find out what their current practices were. We asked them to take a look and see what their numbers were, if they, were, if, if they felt they were accurate. 
Uh, I think one thing about reporting data is it is sometimes not uh, as accurate as you would expect it would be or you would want it to be, so we had conversations with them about that. And through our permits and through the assistance in the legislation, we are trying to address the, uh, the legislation that's on the books right now addresses certain sectors. We feel that's effective. Um, I, I can't speak to what's going to happen with additional legislation, but um, we are trying to address as many of these sources as we can in terms of making sure that the risk associated with those is going to be something that is uh, not going to tip that, that uh, 100 million number that we've been hearing about. Can I just, uh, before we go on with another question, we had a firm end time of 8.30. I want you to know that it's past that now, and um, we're going to go on for about another hour, if that's okay with everyone. We're extending um, in Waukegan. Also, our translators will be staying there. So I just wanted to let you know if anyone is interested in the time. It is about um, 10 of 9. Um, we're going to continue uh, for a bit longer. I wanted to let you know. Thank you. The next three is Daryl Monroe, Susan Henning, and Thomas Wizard. Uh, hello, Director Kim. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be here in uh, professional capacity as well as the personal capacity. I'm going to say professional. <laughs> I'm the reporter with Belgium Public Radio, uh, the U.S. correspondent here, and there's quite a bit of interest in the case here in Illinois because uh, the European Union regulations, uh, if this type of situation would have taken place in Germany and Belgium, there would have been criminal charges for our first two years. Not to mention a lot of down at the facilities, and so uh, basically, uh, I sent you uh, about three weeks ago several questions about what's going on here in Illinois, and obviously these questions were not responded to. That's where I take a liberty of being a Ron Lake resident here to bring those questions to you. Um, there's a statement from the legal firm, from Grinsfelder Law Firm analysis. It's not involved in the situation, but I think uh, basically it shows the uh, intent by the Illinois Department um, or EPA and the uh, companies that are being sued right now to pollute, collude, to make sure that people don't get the justice. And here's the state, uh, the analysis from Greenfeather's law firm that's not involved in this whole thing. It's just, skip, it's about a minute read, so please bear with me. Often, it's, it's regarding a specific situation here in Illinois. Often in environmental tort or statutory citizen suitcases initiated by the plaintiff against an owner or operator of industrial source or operation in Illinois, a defendant will point to a compliance with an environmental permit or its cooperation with regulatory program or an agreement with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency as the evidence that the relief sought by the plaintiff is without merit. We never expected the state of Illinois to support what plaintiffs have been arguing, that its own environmental agency issues permits and authorizes environmental activity offering no protection to the public from exposure to harmful pollutants and no protection to the compliant permittee. So my questions are three, actually, just the same way I have stated in discussions to the press officer, which I received no response whatsoever. First of all, uh, you, you, uh, you mentioned the very magic word criminal uh, persecution for some, you know, uh, some, some situation that takes place. Please let me know at least one case where the Illinois EPA has uh, referred uh, the uh, environmental case to the Illinois AG for criminal prosecution. Just one case. The past 20 years. This is not that finished yet. Number two. Do you want me to wait? Yes, I'll just wait. And number two, uh, the question would be very simple. Uh, why uh, you as a, as a person representing the Illinois government, and uh, for example, you are absolutely correct in your earlier statement stating that the Illinois EPA has absolutely no power to shut down any operation whatsoever. However, the federal EPA does. Why you didn't go to federal EPA, I understand a lot of different political ramifications with current situation with the Trump EPA or have you, 
but you can at least make an effort to go to the federal APA to actually have an automatic shutdown of the operation, citing the crisis situation. Yes, you can do that. It is within your statutory, statutory regulatory power to do that. You can do that. Um, and third, I'm asking maybe a bit of a, of a hypothetical question because most of my listeners are in the European Union and they simply cannot comprehend why the, fed, the state official would, would not basically, maybe they have a very old fashioned way of looking at things relative between citizen and the government, that a primary job of the government is to support human life, protect human life. It is that simple. So why is simply not doing the job? And now, uh, I just want to kind of draw my professional demeanor here and just address our political class here. Uh, Mr. Schneider, two days ago I have seen your interview on the Hill in Washington. And frankly, um, I've had in Ukraine the past four years. I know the language really well, but three media outlets. I'm sorry, sir, but you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Ms. Ms. Bush. Sorry, excuse me. Ms. Bush, let me explain something to you. I'm sorry. One, one question to you, too. Please return the money that you have taken from uh, Maguire Consulting, major corporation that supports chemical manufacturers. Please do that. I'm sorry. And by the way, Belgium is one of the largest users of ethylene oxide. Uh, yes, but the, the, the thing that we have to bring back in focus is that, is that the questions this evening are to be directed to the panel. The panel should have an opportunity to answer. I believe that you asked three questions of the regulatory agencies and they attempted to answer and you asked them to wait. I would like to get to those answers if we may. Would you please answer the questions the gentleman directed to you? Thank you. So I think the first question you asked was uh, give an example where the Illinois and, and the criminal statute or the criminal penalty I was referring to is if uh, if a regulated entity submits a uh, falsified or fraudulent document to us either uh, as part of a permit application or as part of a reporting data or what have you in Illinois it's a class four felony. So the most recent example we have of that is we had a facility located uh, in Springfield. Uh, that conducted an improper asbestos removal. They submitted in a, they submitted falsified documents to us. We worked with US EPA and the FBI and the Department of Justice. They brought an action. The responsible parties, one person is uh, in federal prison. The other parties uh, received different sentences. Penalties, what was it? Forfeiture. When? Pardon me? When? Uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, in terms of US EPA, as I mentioned before, uh, we had conversations with US EPA as to whether or not they would be taking action and as opposed to the state of Illinois having to step in. And that's what I referred to before, when they said that their position in this is immediate action to respond to something like this is done at the state level and the local level, not at the federal level. And that's why they declined to take any kind of action. And the third question? I, I, you'll have to refresh my recollection. What was the third question? Well, uh, about social contract. You as a regulator. Okay, yeah. So, so we take our mission statement very seriously, and the permits that we've issued, the permits that we're contemplating, the requirements that we've developed, the requirements that then made the way into legislation, <coughs> all do exactly what you're talking about, which is go towards achieving, and certainly in the United States, I, I, I mean, I've heard in, in the world, but certainly in the United States, the most restrictive set of requirements that would be imposed upon a facility, a commercial sterilizer using ethylene oxide. There is no other state, there's nothing at the federal level that goes as far as what we do. So we feel we have taken whatever existing level of regulation there is and pushed it well beyond anything else that's out there. So I think that you're right, we do have that mission. That's a, it's a responsibility that we have and we feel that that's the best evidence of how we address that here. But one, one thing I want to ask, uh, why, I think it's why time to move on to the next question, Sir, I understand years. that you feel passionate, so does everyone here, and this gentleman has been waiting a long time. We're going to move to the next question. Thank you. My name is Tom, uh, I'm a resident of Gurney. I used to live near Willowbrook. Uh, why I just moved here, I began to question. Um, <laughs> I knew of the problem, and I had faith that the legislation that I was going through was going to address this problem. Um, but I'm starting to lose faith in our governing bodies, such as yours, 
Um, Mr. Kim, I know that South ETO, Senator Bush, I know the Mayor of Gurney, I know the Mayor of Waukegan have all been asking you to come and do this town hall in Grace Lake, in Grace Lake or in our area. And you've repeatedly denied those requests. There's even a Tribune article saying the IEPA denied Ms. Kovarek's request to hold a town hall meeting with the IEPA. My question to you is, in May, you attended an industry meeting with the Chemical Industry Council of Illinois on May 7th. You gave a keynote speech. Um, the invite on their website touts it as a place where you can come talk to, of, quote, officials who are friends of the chemical industry, end quote. Not my words. Exactly on the website. If you don't believe me, go look. I'm sorry I'm shaking and I'm upset, but this is our health. Thank you for finally coming to look into our eyes, the people who are being poisoned by ethylene oxide. We can debate some of the science between exactly how powerful the chemical it is to hurt us, but we know it's cancerous. That's an undebatable fact. My question to you is, why have we not been a priority? Why have you repeatedly said no, but in, you just said that your agency, you're committed to public health, and that's your commitment and your mission, but instead, you've gone to speak with the chemical industry and the lobbyists who Medline and Vantage are both a part of that group. You went to go speak to them before coming to look at us in the face. And it's our health. It's our health. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, um, our agency has actually spent more resources uh, addressing the situation with Medline than we have with Sterigenics. The, the action that was going on with Sterigenics, the litigation and so forth, was in large part being handled by very capable attorneys at the Attorney General's Office and the State's Attorney. We provided technical assistance, but the bulk of our efforts that we have been expending has been towards uh, developing the controls that we've talked about here. And as far as the, the, the engagement that you talked about, so um, just help us understand why we weren't the priority. Yeah, and no. Your agency is supposed to protect our health, just like you said as your mission statement. Well, you routinely denied requests to come visit. That's no. Well, so as far as that, let, let me just say this: the the, the best way for a, a state agency like ours that regulates uh, entities across the state is to make sure that we talk with everybody. We talk with um, stakeholders, we talk with environmental groups, we talk with uh, elected officials, we talk with the regulated community. The <laughs> engagement, that, and, and you know, I certainly I did go to a lunch meeting there. It was, uh, I, get, I, I don't know how they called it, it was a 10 minute lunch meeting. That's what the invite says uh, on their, on their website. Right. So well, that's well, their intent of meeting you. Yeah, so but, but, well, I, well, I can Whether tell that you what, was your intent. No, no, I, well I can tell you what it was. It was a, it was a 10 minute meeting, or 10 minute, presentation by me and actually what I was talking about with them was the impending legislation and, and, and how the uh, the General Assembly was working with us to bring tighter restrictions on that type of uh, business sector but um, again going back we have been studying uh, it, it, it's probably not visible on the outside but if you look at the man hours and you look at our staff we've been spending a great deal of time trying to address this and the results that we've come up with, we think, are meaningful. They, they're born out of the legislation. They're born out of the permit. And you know, I apologize. I am sorry I have not come up here sooner or more frequently. Um, we With have the respect you should be. You should be speaking well, to the I, citizens I, before I, industry I, groups. And I, I appreciate that. I do. And, and sure. I, I, I take what you're saying to heart, and I do appreciate that. Will you commit to coming again after the second round of testing? Uh, well, here's the thing. I, no, no, no. I have no problem coming back again. The second round of testing, what I'm saying is, look, I want to come back if I have something that I can talk about. The, the testing I think you're referring to is testing that's being done by the county that's going to be sent to uh, ATSDR. Illinois EPA has no involvement with that, so I wouldn't really have anything to contribute to that. I will come back when the uh, permits have been issued and we have some results in terms of what the, the data shows from the, the uh, operations of the facility. Yeah, in, in other words, to talk about what the results are of our permit, I would, yes, I will come back. So um, it, it is important when you come up to ask your one question, so much as you are able, and uh, we're ready to move on to the next. Hi, uh, three people, Saeed Karim from Green Oaks, Maureen uh, Barbrick from Lake Bluff, 
and Peggy Inez from Gurdy. Yeah, Peggy draws. I'm withdrawing my question. Withdrawing question. Okay, perfect. We'll pick another day. Come on up. Uh, we have Joe Manny. Hello everyone, I'm Sayed Kevin and I'm forfeiting my chance to go. My name is Don Rex. May, may I just suggest when you talk into a microphone, you need to have your mouth much closer to the microphone than you would ever guess. <laughs> The first time I had to do that, somebody told me, imagine just like one finger or two fingers between the mic and your mouth, and people will be able to hear you much more clearly. So, I don't know, um, I, f I feel like my, my question is not going to be answered. Because what I'm hearing is when Sarah Jennings was in the limelight, you were working with Medline to help them get permits to continue to poison our community. Yeah. So before I, before I move on, everybody knows serogenics was shut down? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Got my three-year-old son, Samuel, has been breathing since the day I brought him home from the hospital. We live one mile from Medline. It's in my backyard, three miles from Vantage. My three-year-old son is battling for his life. I shouldn't even be here. He was diagnosed with leukemia in August, which is directly linked to ethanol oxide, as you know. What? actions, if any, will you be implementing to shut down these facilities? Why was Serogenics forced to shut down in February? What actions will you be implementing to protect the children of Lake County? Waiting for your updated NISHAP standards is not acceptable, is not an acceptable excuse to allow these facilities to continue to put children at risk. Seven children die every day from childhood cancer. How many more children have to die before action is taken? In November 2nd, 2018, the Chicago Tribune article, Arthur Dye Michael Hawthorne, stated that Vantage Specialty chem Chemicals and Gurney released 6,412 pounds of ethylene oxide in 2014, more than serogenics and Medline combined. During that same period, yet federal and state officials confirmed that someone at the state level failed to provide the facility's ethanol oxide emissions to US EPA. Can you explain how that happened? Why it took so long to inform the public? My child, my three-year-old child has leukemia. And you said yes, that you would live Move into my house. First of all, I'm very sorry. I, I'm very sorry about your family situation. I'm very sorry about your time. More than anything else, more than a regular or anything else, I'm a parent. I don't think there's anything more sacred than that, and I'm very sorry. To answer your questions, um, the uh, I, I think yeah. I think some of the questions I, I, I sort of answered. And I, I won't be redundant, but um, the uh, there was a situation with I think you, you raised a question about some uh, reporting. There was a uh, the, the manner in which we reported data to US EPA reflected zero emissions when in fact it was supposed to uh, indicate that there was there were emissions that just weren't logged into our system. It was an oversight. It was corrected, and and we did not. 
you know, frankly, until uh, we were going through this, we didn't catch it. And we did Shame catch it. Well, I, I, it, it, it was a mistake, and we did fix it. Um, uh, and, but going forward, again, the, the, the legislation that's out there that's specifically applicable to Vantage will have an annual number that will be imposed upon them. Her cries say it all. Oh, well. Yes. Hi, I'm Joe Manning from Lake Forest. Um, I think a lot of us are really concerned about the Illinois EPA looking after our best interests and public health. So I'm going to ask some pointed points is, will the Illinois EPA, will you take this back to your office, what we're learning here tonight, and work towards settling, work towards setting acceptable emission levels for the record instead of some fuzzy or unknown numbers? And will you hold companies and facilities accountable to accurately measure such levels? And specifically, what will the Illinois EPA do to verify that the numbers that are being reported by companies and facilities are accurate? And will this, such information be made available, publicly available? We're not doing very well with these fuzzy numbers. So, uh, I think your first question was, will we set emission levels? And I think what we, we have done that through the annual emission limit. The emission limits that, are, that we've set by permit and that we will be setting by permit that are required by law um, will cap the amount of emissions that will come out of the facility. And so you can see that based on that annual cap, you can make a determination if you back calculate what the monthly or, or uh, emissions would be. And those will, to, in terms of what will the actual numbers be, the requirement in permit and the new legislation is that we have what's called a continuous emission monitor on all emission points at these facilities so that we will have uh, regular continuous data in terms of what is actually coming out of the staff. Um, you asked how we verify the numbers. I, I'll, I'll defer to, Kevin can answer that in just a second here and tell you exactly what the technical process is. I think the last question is, are they publicly available? All this information is publicly available. It, it's all, we, we've been trying to put as much information as we can on our website, but to the extent that there's something that public seeks that we don't have on there, all you need to do is submit a request to us. It's an online request, and then the, the information, it's not protected, it's, it's, it's public information. So with regards to verifying the numbers, their permits are requiring them to have a continuous emission monitoring system on. A system will be installed and certified by third party. We will evaluate those reports, their accuracy. And then the, those numbers will, will continuously monitor emissions out of the stack. Um, knowing full well that nowhere in the industry of commercial sterilizers is that being required, and Illinois has taken steps to do that to accurately account for all the emissions from those facilities. Sir, I'm sorry, I need to interject something here that you just said numbers are really important and indeed they are. And sometimes when we are at the microphone, we uh, something slips our mind because we're focusing on something else. This wonderful woman who spoke so passionately about what her child is going through forgot to say at the microphone that there are five other women in the area going through the same thing she is, and she had told them that she would be their voice tonight, and she wanted to be sure that the fact that there are five other families going through the same thing was mentioned. So I asked her permission to make that announcement at the podium. Thank you. Very sorry about your, your son and the other families that are experiencing these health problems. One thing I mentioned at the beginning is that we work very closely with uh, pediatricians and physicians who specialize in environmental medicine consult with us. And if you talk with me afterwards, I can give you their information. And if you have any questions you want to ask of a medical issue, if we can help uh, uh, arrange for that consultation. The next three names are Basim Iftikhar from uh, Hawthorne Woods, Tom Bennett from Gurney, and Kaya from Waukegan. Good 
you have heard recently in the last one week or so, there was a drug in the market that was recalled because it had traces of a carcinogen. This drug was widely used by choice and these traces of carcinogen found in this drug resulted in the withdrawal of this drug globally. Yes. Now it is, there, nobody was forcing people to eat, take this drug. Now with the air, you, all, you are actually forcing people and yet I see a lack of coordination between policies. Uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion between silos and I think the system probably is not working optimally but when leaders are taken, take charge, they work over the system. They, they make, they take action to overcome the difficulties in the system and I urge you all to do that because I think you have been elected as leaders and the system is only named for numbers. The human being makes the determination of what is right or wrong. So that is my request. They do not worry about things because obviously it's more important. My question is, we are living in a global scientific era. Do we, have we made attempts to look at what is happening in Europe with regards to ethylene oxide? Which countries have banned it? Which countries allow it within, within the vicinity of a populated area? I think we need more research and more understanding than what I have heard today. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Bennett. I'm from Gurney. Uh, it's pretty clear you're playing with fire from what all we've heard tonight. Mistakes can be made that affect real human lives. Uh, what if you find out five years from now, oh no, this really does cause all kinds of problems for people. Uh, you can't go back. Why not shut it down now until you figure out if it's going to cause problems? If you don't requires an act that we don't have the authority to do. Save lives. Yeah. Federal EPA. Federal EPA. Is that what you're saying? What happened in Willowbrook? Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah live out of the area in, 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 in Illinois. Are you aware that red light executives have moved out of Lake County to Cook County and Glencoe and Winnetka? So I don't know if you feel that you're more uh, available to basically withstand the effects of ethylene oxide. We do know that it has the explosive techniques and red light has known for 30 years that this is a toxic substance and they continually emit it throughout poisoning by a thousand deaths the people in the community. And they recently wanted to increase their stack like to expose all of Lake County so that their levels of air quality would be even lower. Now, and meanwhile, they have, pub they have sacrificed the public health of this community for the benefits of greed and, and billions of dollars in the medical industry. Then why, when I just recently saw this now, that that Lake County passed a law that Medline and Vantage get grandfathered in by the new law that will allow them to have existing within 10 miles of daycares, homes, and schools? Why? Why would they pass a law and have this this grandfathered in if you're so in, in, so in passing laws and enforcing them? So, so two points. Uh, you mentioned the stack height race. Um, the purpose behind the uh, the 
permit reflecting the, the potential for raising the stack height is actually counter to what you're saying. The modeling that we've used demonstrates that if the stack height is raised to the height that we allowed for, didn't require, but allowed for, subject to them getting approval, the result would be all affected areas, all affected people, it doesn't matter where you're looking, but have a lower risk number. Raising that height, because what that does is this, there's a, there's a concept called downwash. If you've got a, a lower height, and you've got surrounding buildings, it creates sort of a vacuum. And when, those, when the, the height is not at an optimum level, it creates a downward pressure and it basically forces those emissions down more than you would get if it's at a higher height. So the reason we asked Medline to pursue that higher height was actually to reduce the level of uh, impact to the surrounding community. That's, it's a scientific one. Um, your, your other question about the grandfather and then, um, this goes back to what I said before. You know, we participated in the legislative exercise and so forth, but that's not, that was not one of our provisions. We don't have the ability to pass laws, obviously, you know, we're not a legislative body. Um, I don't, I can't speak directly to those specific provisions or the determinations made behind that because those were provisions that our agency was not a party to. What we did contribute there were questions that were asked about the technical components of that bill, and that's what we uh, worked on. The other parts that, that you asked about, I, I can't speak to that because that was not something that was coming out of our office. You know, the solution, so. solution is not the solution. Recently, my, I take care of my, nine, my, my grandson since he's been nine days old in grade. His mother, his, mo his other grandmother, worked at the VA hospital for more than 20 years, and then they didn't know that she had basically a blood disorder, a blood disease, until they found out she had liver cancer. And she's had two, basically two liver transplants and a stroke, right? Now, as, as Taya Tanaka has said, this can go on, this can pop at any generation. And when I took my grandson to the doctor in Lindenhurst, and he says, oh, go out and take a walk in the Bernie. I said, I don't take him out for a walk because I don't want him exposed to ethylene oxide. He knew exactly what I meant, exactly. And it scares the death Thank out of me that this will pop Thank up in this generation. Thank you so much. Um, we, as you know, had a hard stop time that we all agreed to throw away a long time ago, but the new stop time has now come and gone, and there are still literally a stack of names in there with questions. Yet we have to figure out how to wind it down and where to go from here. So what we are going to do is draw three more names, and that will be the last three for the evening. And I am going to suggest very, very strongly that there be another time that the rest of the questions can be answered face to face. I know that no one wants to do that. It's very hard to sit up here. It's very hard to be out there. It's a tough thing to have to try to figure out. But the only way we will figure it out together it is together. So we thank you so, so much for being here and ask you please to consider coming again to deal with the rest of the questions. With that, our last three. Um, Sarah Crawford from Bernie come up and Rachel Reinwald from Beach Park come up. And uh, Jennifer from Waukegan has asked us to read her card. So I will start with that while the other two come up. The question is, where was stock ETO 20 years ago? Uh, why all of a sudden, at this height of uh, the political race, has uh, this been brought to light or showcased uh, to, and brought to the forefront? Is this really a political motivated agenda? <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh, question about that. Is that for the group? Because I can answer that. No, that's for Pat. Oh, because you said stop ETO. Yes. I'm assuming stop ETO no. in Lake County? No. We didn't know about it 20 years ago, that's the answer, because we just found out about it November 2nd. Sarah and Rachel. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah Crawford from Gurney. Thank you for coming this evening. I have a two-part question. Um, my first question is, how far out from Medline or Vantage will be considered safe 
from ETO facilities. I've heard one mile is a danger zone. I've heard two miles. I've heard uh, six miles, even 25 miles. So I would, I'm going to stand here and, and ask for that question to be answered, and then I have a second question. I'm not sure that anybody's been able you know, to characterize how far that is with ambient air measurements. So that's what we want from this additional testing is to see when winds are blowing and, and the, when the monitors is downwind, how far can we track emissions from this facility. So I think that's hopefully information that we'll be getting as we move along. But um, this facility is not exactly like sterogenics, but um, what we saw in sterogenics was that it did decrease pretty quickly, but I don't know that anybody could say that there's a danger zone of a specific distance um, without a lot more information than we have right now. Anybody else want to add to that? Does anybody else want to add to that? Put the panel. They, they, they answered. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for answering the question to the best of your ability. I, I, don't like that answer because as a parent of two young daughters, I want to know, do I need to move? Do I need to move from this area because it is not safe to raise my two young children, three and six here. So now, okay, my second part, my second question of the two part question is I've heard that ETO permeates through doors and windows. Is this true? Are we not safe inside our own homes? Because it come, when I open my window, it's going to come into my house if I'm supposedly getting fresh air. You know, again, that, that's not our area of expertise, but we, we would not expect there to be, it would be a barrier. Obviously, there's an exchange between your outdoor air and your indoor air. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but there's really been no measurements then that allows us to know what that it's not a barrier. Not a barrier. So yeah, if it's not a barrier, then I am led to believe that it's coming in through the windows, in through the doors when I open my windows, and that's in my home, and now I'm not safe inside my own home. Uh, I did not see Rachel, so in order to follow the rules, we'll ask one more. Um, Hannah from Waukegan. <coughs> I'd like to make a quick comment. This is, I, I'm sorry, we're going to take another I, question. I a really quick comment that I think would help address a lot of the public here. I know that, and I can be loud, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, I know that a lot of you guys are looking to IEPA and ATSDR for some answers. I'm sorry, my name's Rihanna. I'm from Willowbrook initially, and I'm here to show my support from Stop Sterogenics because we know exactly what you guys are going through, and we're here to back you guys up. Mm -hmm. I want to let you guys know. not going to be your answer because right. they cannot take you where you need to go. Where you need to go is to the witness lips. You need to support House Bill number 3888. Yeah. Make sure that your representatives stand behind you. Please, Melinda Bush, tell me that you will back those bills. Yeah. Tell your constituents that you will back those bills. Will those bills come over? As they are. I don't know that they're going to be as they are. If they do, you need to support your constituents. I have yes. been supporting my constituents. No, you're not. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. I could, I'm going to tell you that if those bills come over and they are in, they are done in a way that we can enforce them, I will absolutely support them. And I will continue to work on them after they come to the Senate. Absolutely. I've worked with, I believe you know, Senator Curran yes, fairly well. well. He's, He's someone, buddy. mine too. Yes. He has been my partner through all of this. Your constituents need to know that you will support whatever will protect them to the greatest ability that you can. That's what I have Those done and that's what I'll continue to do. To also, I'm sorry, I have, I have You follow the graphics that they have very carefully put together that you are supporting it correctly. Go down to Springfield. ATSDR is great. They are not dealing with modeling like EPA is. They actually are dealing with science. Look at their charts. When we had those facility under a seal order, 95% 
drop and it stayed down while that seal order was in place. Ma'am, your support for this evening is so appreciated. I and I hate to do that. Let her finish. Let her finish. Again, excuse me, again, everyone feels their voice is the most important. And I want to make sure that their voices are heard. So please, call your elected officials, send postcards, go down to Springfield, support those yeah. witness slips. I'm happy to continue statements. that. Thank you. you do need to do that. Voices heard, and, and she's absolutely right. Fill out the witness slips. Here's a hearing on October 9th. Is that correct? October 10th. I apologize. Um, I'm sure Rita, you will have that information on your side of uh, By your website, there's it's the hearing at the Atlanta building in Chicago. All right, so there's a hearing. Uh, I believe both of the bills have been introduced. I do want to tell you a couple of things so we can re wrap up. First of all, there is additional testing that's being done. You know, um, basically, WTO asked for 90 days of testing. You know, it's a, we are going to be delivering on that, you know, so that we make sure that we have testing that, um, that you trust as best as possible and that we know um, is the best testing you can possibly do. So we're going to do that. Um, I also want to make clear I know that sometimes it's confusing to understand. Nobody was grandfathered in any bill that Lake County passed or that the state of Illinois passed. Um, any new regulations um, have to be adhered to by anyone who is using ethylene oxide for sterilization. Um, and I want to tell you. What about manufacturing? What about manufacturing? Uh, manufacturing, I think most of you know that I passed a bill that deals with Vantage and Vantage only because it was literally the only bill that we could get out that dealt with manufacturing. And I made sure that we were able to get something done How for do Lake County. How do you control the manufacturer reducing their production during the 90 day sample? I'm sorry, could you? How do you control for the manufacturer reducing their production during the 90 day sample? We don't believe that they can do that for 90 days. We don't, and I believe Stop ETO feels that way. This is something, when we ask what are the two most important things uh, that Stop ETO wanted, 90-day testing, they can't shut down for that, that length of time. Not, not shutting down, but they can reduce the production levels below what they might normally do. Sure, but if we're testing every day during that time. Anyway, I understand. Believe me, that's why we're doing the 90 days. And, and so I think probably, and if you have some questions, too, I know that they'd probably like to head out, but I'm sure they're happy to answer some of those for you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, we will find a way to uh, bring John, thank you for agreeing to come back up again. Um, we'll find a way to either on a blog, uh, you know, we'll give you an email address where you can, yes.
which is part of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in Cornell. It's an ivy tower place like Northwestern. There are three various causes what it does to you. Everybody here tonight, including those of us from Willowbrook, have to worry about cancer for the rest of our lives and be followed. The children, it mutates your chromosomes, it mutates your genes. For parents, no, you are not safe in your own home until sterogenics pulled out. I've been packing up my home to move out. In addition to that, I'm sorry, did you have a question? No, one more point. I want to know about the governmental agencies and why is ethylene oxide allowed anywhere near a residential area? It's highly explosive. So Wait a minute, it's used. Finish. It's used to make hyperbaric weapons. Is that enough for you? Thank you for sharing your thoughts, but we have to close out the night right now. We've had our three last questions of the evening. The panelists have agreed that they will stay around for a bit for a one-on-one -on -one question to be answered if you have a question. Um, hopefully, we will be able to get together again in a similar form. Thank you all for your thoughts. Thank you for being here tonight.